in a world crying out for a top 10 show. John Roca and Matt Nost are here to bring you the top 10. Brought to you by the Schmoes No. Take it away, boys. All right, welcome everybody to this week's edition of the Top 10 Show. So much to talk about. This this subject is going to be an intense little subject for us to go through, uh, and I can't wait to get to it. Uh, I'm John Roca. Uh, I am uh, Matt Nost. <laughs> uh, uh, do you yes. want to let the cat out of the bag at the beginning? Oh, well, sure, if you want. Well. You like to, you like to uh, yeah. uh, open the curtain. You like to pull the so curtain. Do you. So, so do you. So do you. Sure, it's true. You, we both do it. We, cho- we choose our times. We choose our moments to do it. Yeah. yeah, on this one. So we had a technical error, and we did half the show already. We, we, yes, pretty much. Literally. We, we got to my number five. Yes, number we did. Five. That's half the show. That is half the show. Right. A little over half, actually, technically. Yeah, fair. And uh, we got through the discussion on five, and then I went to check on things. And uh, I'm going to chalk it up to human error. Sure. Other people are giving me an out. Uh, oh, not John, the other individual we spoke with. Yeah, because I don't know anything about this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and he was just like, it could be... A corrupted hard drive, because what you're telling me, it's never done that before, so I don't oh. know. Oh, yeah. wow. Well, he's like, it, it created two files where there shouldn't be, there should be only one, <laughs> and they're so small that they, there's no way there's any kind of recording. Wouldn't you know it? It would have to happen on our show. It's just perfect timing. Yeah. I still think it's got to be human error, because <laughs> if the thing's never fucked up once, and suddenly it does with two guys that have never used it, <laughs> it's got to be the guy that did it. <laughs> Just has to. Well, so it's my I'm fault not, that we're here. I'm not blaming you. It's just the way it is. It's sometimes these things happen. I've made many mistakes in life, so I'm. Yeah, an, but I'm how, how many of them judge. have been recorded? You know what I mean? Where the, yeah, I don't know. The Jenny. Well, can't. this wasn't recorded technically. I can't, yeah, yeah, but the aftermath of it <laughs> sure, is sure. recorded. Okay. Uh, this will know. buy me some time if this ever happens on my end. So this buys me a little bit of leeway. So I exactly I appreciate. Well, that. thankfully we're in a good enough place amongst the two of us that it's yeah. just like a, you know what that should happen. Yeah. We're both tired. Yeah. I think we both probably got up at roughly the same time today. Mm, probably around 6.30 on my end. Okay. Uh, I think I got, I got up at 7.30. Oh, okay. Yeah, right on. Yeah. But I didn't get to bed till 2.30. Yeah, fair. See, I got to bed at like 12.30. And so it's like... That's I got, Yeah. That's I, I, I'm good on six, five or six hours. I can function fine. Seven or eight is obviously optimal, but I don't need it. Five yeah. or six, I can function. Yeah. Six is my six and beyond. I'm good to go. Five, Yeah. I have varying... Pockets yeah. of like I'm good, and then I'll hit like a two hour stretch where my body just is like, oh man, I'm so tired. Yeah. Thankfully, I haven't hit that wall this evening. Mm, good. I did this afternoon. Uh huh. At like two p.m. I was Oof. just like, ah, oh, fuck, man, because I, from the moment I got up, I was out the door half hour later, and I yeah. had been going until basically two p.m. Ugh. And then I finally got to stop. Yeah. But it was went to had to fight traffic to get down into Orange County, do something down there, and then go to another section of Orange County, and then go to another section of Orange County, Ugh. and then get back up here. In time to do some things around here, then right. to come here, make up, and then do a half an hour to you of right. the show. Right. We just did 30 minutes of talking at each other <laughs> with no recording. <laughs> that hurts. That hurts. That happens, man. It does. It's part of the show. The problem is we are, you guys don't even know the gold, Jerry. The gold. <laughs> You're right. We had a really good show. It was a good point. show, too. Yeah, we were in a sweet it. spot. Yeah. We'll, it we'll, sucks. We'll try to recreate it if we can while we're doing this uh, just particular version of the show. But uh, like, But that's the way it goes sometimes, you know, and that's probably why we need, uh, you know. This is the greatest song in the world. You know what I mean? Oh, right. This is the song about the song that we can't remember, (laughs) but this song is still pretty amazing. Let's just recognize the fact that this is a gem as well. This is a Tenacious D song. Absolutely. Uh, (laughs) Uh, Anyway, so this week we decided to do uh, top 10 whistleblower movies. Correct. uh, In honor of the Liam Neeson movie coming out about Mark Felt, where he's playing Mark Felt, Mm -hmm. who was deep throat during the uh, Watergate investigation. And for some of you who maybe don't know the ins and outs of Watergate, Mark Felt was this person who worked inside the Nixon White House. Oh, no, the CIA or something like that. Uh, Yeah, he didn't work in the White House. He worked on the... I want to say in the Pentagon or, or something the F- like that. It was the FBI. Maybe CIA, it was, yeah, yeah. yeah. But either way, he's the one that can, that uh, gave Woodward and Bernstein, uh, who were the Washington Post reporters at the time, uh, uh, dis- uh, discovering the Watergate situation, um, gave them information. Yeah, in, got in, fed up with the situation. Yep. 
Yep. And didn't like the people were lying from the uh, president administration were lying to the press and, and lying to the people. Covering it all up. They were covering it all up, right? And so he provided documents or provided details and provided them directions for Bernstein and Woodward to go to get the information to expose the Watergate corruption. And that took two years. So this wasn't like overnight. No. This guy gave him Manila envelope. And that's what people and forget. They, they think yeah. it's like you know we're now used to a twenty four hour news cycle. Which right. Is like hit me, hit me. What do you got? What do you got? It's yeah. just like a story this big. It's got to come out in just crumbs. Yep. Until you get to a big one, and that big one leads to larger crumbs. And then right. that, you know, eventually, if the dominoes are large enough, as in this case they were, you can yeah. topple a presidency. Mm-hmm. And had Nixon come out early on, he might have been able to, like, you know, head this off at the pass. Oh, absolutely. I always say this, and the same thing goes with these guys, guys who take steroids. Just come out and admit it. We want to forgive you. Just come out and admit it and say, you know what? I did it. I made a mistake. I just wanted to achieve success. Yeah. I wanted to be successful. I, look, I, I did this because I was nervous about being president. I was nervous that I was going to lose the election, and I hired these guys to go in. That's the irony of Watergate is this motherfucker was, like, destroyed McGovern, and he didn't need to get these guys in there and try to— ex- ex- He was uh, you just know, so paranoid. He was paranoid, right? That's what Nixon was, and it led to his downfall in the end because paranoia is what led to his success too is constantly being aware of being fucked over oh, yeah. all the time he it made him sharp as a political mind all yeah, the time exactly just like uh the, the one-upsmanship but also like the currying favor and scratching the backs and keeping tally and score exactly exactly and it was it served him well until it was his downfall his greatest right. strength became his weakness yeah and when you s- listen to some of those tapes or read the transcripts it's really unsettling how fucking paranoid how much how paranoid he was about oh, everything yeah. and the sycophantic nature of the people that are in his inner circle which yep. I would assume a lot of presidents have that. Yeah, true. If not all of them on some level right. have people around them that think that, yeah, I have to support the president because mm-hmm. he can take my job away. He's the mm-hmm. president. For He's the president. Sakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of course, yes, we should do this. That sounds like a reasonable thing. We see that happening with uh, with Trump now. All this, all this stuff he's like uh, <laughs> fighting back against, and you have his inner circle just spins every stupid thing that happens. They spin it in a way that's like, oh, it's you. Guys. the media is making a big deal. That's every politician. Yeah, right? yeah. Every single one has yes men around him. Now, whether right. or not it comes but down Every single one fucks up to this level constantly. True. It's whether or not you agree with the yes men. Yes. It's whether or not you find offense in, in what's happening. But they all have it. Yeah. Because, you know, they, they promote people into the positions that helped get them there. That's true. So it's an echo chamber. That's a very good point, man. Yeah. yeah. I only hear the voices I've always heard, mm-hmm. and we kind of, you know, share a brain on some level. Yeah. We, there's still independent thought within that, but there's a reason we're all surrounded by one another. Yeah. One another. That's true. So... Yeah, it's just whether or not you agree with the message that's coming out of it is what it comes down to. <laughs> right, exactly. It's what it always comes down to yeah. about anything, you know, if you agree with the message. But anyway, so we, we thought this would be an interesting subject because we've never done this subject. We've never done top 10 whistleblower no. movies. Uh, and we were originally going to do some other subject, but I I couldn't get to 10 and feel comfortable with 10 on the yeah, other side. I could have gotten there. Yeah, right. Matt, Matt says he could have gotten there. I, well, you already know that because I told you that at the start of the last well, show. Stop, stop ruining the magic. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is something. That's the only thing so far that we've said that we said the first time. That's true. That's true. So there you go, fuckers. <laughs> all right. That's all new. That's all new. Enjoy the that. magic of no humor in that last book. I just hope it's still recording. We'll see if it's still well, recording. You know what? I'm going to go check You're right now. Check right now. All right. Yes. I'm I will, having that shit happen again. I will vamp again. So anyway. Uh, I'm this place on fire. <laughs> So for those who don't know, we're recording actually in the Collider Studios because now that I'm full time here, I can stay after and record some stuff. It's still going. All right. Awesome. And Adam Smith has let us uh, record some stuff here on uh, record the podcast here on the the studio. So it's really great of him. Uh, But anyway, yeah, so I couldn't get to 10. Uh, and then this, I saw this film and I, I texted Matt. I said, I can get to 10 with this subject. Do you like this subject? And Matt said, sure, I can do that. And so we got, we decided to pick top 10 whistleblower movies. And, uh, I, I'm looking forward to this movie. Liam Neeson looks great in the trailer. Uh, and the whole thing just look, and you have Bruce Greenwood. So there's a lot of people involved in this movie. It looks really excellent. And so I personally can't wait to see it. I hope it's a good movie. I love political yeah. movies that are done well. I mean, if it was excellent, it'd be coming out in December. Well, we're still in the fall season where Oscar winner films come start coming out. So maybe I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It's September. Yeah, but or this comes out in in early October. This, no, comes, this out, comes out comes out late September. Yeah, late September. That's right. Yeah, so it's still September. Yeah, it's usually not the most fertile ground for Oscar winning movies. All right, if you say so. I wonder what the breakdown is by month. I mean, now we know that a lot of the Oscar bait comes out at the very end of the year. They, yes, they December. do the. We'll release it in a handful of theaters, whatever the minimum criteria is now, and then do the wide release Jan- the first weekend of January and right, stuff right. like that. Uh, 
I just don't know how many come out of September. I don't know off the top of my head, but it doesn't seem like the best, you know, the most mined area for Oscar winning right. films or even Oscar nominated films. That's fair. That's fair. But I think this looks good. And I hope it's good. I hope it's great. Right. Because the trailer is intense. So I, 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 I like good political movies. Uh, so anyway, all right, do you want to tell them how the show works, Matt? Sure. Once uh, John and I set a topic, we go our individual ways and create personal top ten lists. Then we show back up here. I do my bottom three. He does his bottom three. I do my next two. Then he does his next two. Then we trade one apiece. Once we've revealed our personal top tens, we create the shows between the two of us. That's well done. Not bad. Look at that. Uh, and, and now we're going to pretend like we don't know what's on each other's lists. Well, we don't remember the specific order. Yeah, we- <laughs> <laughs> yes that's true let's do it as we're old men and I, we, I know where our commonalities already lie and i know where i've already technically pissed you off well, no oh yeah you not guys you pissed sh- redline roca was back no that's Long not true time listeners <laughs> he was the anger uh, emotion from inside out it was amazing <laughs> the lewis black yes <laughs> he's just going bananas i love that guy by the way yeah no, that movie's so excellent <laughs> so excellent um, All right, so what's your number 10? So my number 10 uh, is the uh, early 90s Tom Cruise film, The Firm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's my acting coming into that play. Is, listen, you're a much better actor than I am. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a very fun movie. So what he is is he's a newly out of Harvard Law School, and he's mm-hmm. a, you know finished near the top of his class, and mm-hmm. he's the rising star and he gets approached by uh, a well-to-do law firm that does, like, taxes and stuff out of Memphis. And, uh, you know, he doesn't really seem to ask any questions because they offer him a house and they offer him a hell of a salary and a nice car. And it seems like this idyllic kind of, you know, laid back because it's in Memphis. It's not a hectic hustle and bustle, big New York City. So right. it's a more, like, genteel kind of atmosphere. And he gets charmed into this world. And, of course, these these people... Yeah, they are doing some some terrible things. Uh, yep. Hence the whistleblower status. Yep, uh, and they're kind of mixed up with the wrong types of people, and they're doing shady tax things for the wrong sorts of people. Right. So ultimately, uh, some some you know some things happen within the on the firm side, and Tom Cruise doesn't like where his his potential future is trending, and the FBI approaches him. It's like, listen, you need to you need to help us take down your firm, everybody in this, like, this is not good. And he's got to make a choice ultimately between whether or not he's going to help the government or he's going to, or sacrifice the people that are around him. But more so, he seems more concerned with his future as a lawyer, which is kind of selfish. Right. Now that we're a little older looking back on it. Uh, So he strikes a deal with the government and, you know, I don't want to spoil the movie for you if you haven't seen it, but it's a whistleblower <laughs> film, so you have a rough understanding of where it goes. Mm-hmm. But it's a you know excellent performances from a bunch of different actors with Tom Cruise, Gene Hackman, Wilford Brimley. Uh, oh shoot, we, Hal Holbrook. Yeah, Hal Holbrook. Um, yep. And I cannot pull the wife's name. Uh, Gian Triplehorn. There you go. She was in Basic Instinct. Yep. Uh huh. And Holly Hunt. Holly, Holly Hunter, Hunter, rather. Yes, Holly Hunter's in it as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so a bunch of great performances, and it was also like a nice little somewhat change of pace for Tom Cruise at that point. Yeah. Um, kind of delving more into like a, I guess, less away from the action mm-hmm. and more into like a, adult themes. Yeah. Uh, but still with like the intensity of an action film. Yeah. On some level. Right. And, and I, I like this film because I'm a massive Grisham fan. I read a, a, a lot of his, a fan rather. I read a lot of his books back then. And when he was releasing them, um, I was managing a bookstore at the time, part time. So I would get the books and immediately just devour them. And, what uh, was the, the bookstore? Huh? Uh, I worked for three of them. I worked for B. Dalton Booksellers. I worked for Crown Books. And okay. then I worked. Crown, I know. Yeah. And then I worked for another one. Bar, uh, I didn't work for Barnes and Noble, but I worked for another bookstore that was like a mom and pop bookstore, like a pop up bookstore that was just okay. mom. And, it was just like a they bought a store and they wanted to create a bookstore. So and they, what was the first one? Uh, B. Dalton. B. Dalton. That's an East Coast one. B. Dalton's. Yeah. I mean, I, I technically grew up on the East Coast. OK. But it sounds vaguely familiar. Right. 
It was like maroon with uh, cream color. That was their color scheme. Maroon okay, yeah. Cream. I think there was one of those with my ball. That and yep. maybe a Walden Books or something like yeah, that. Yeah, Walden Books. That was another one too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I think yeah. Those were the two. I think Walden was the one we went to more often. I, I remember Walden, yeah. And so so anyway, I, I would get the books and I would just read them, devour them all the time. And The Firm is one that I read all the time. Like 10 times I read that thing. And, and uh, Time to Kill I enjoyed a lot. And uh, a bunch of other books that I he okay. released. Uh, but this is one that I was looking forward to the movie, see if it was disappointing. And it was actually damn good. And uh, it didn't make my list, but only because these other ten I think are like just a little bit better for me on in terms of movies themselves, you know. And and so this this at times uh, suffers from a bit, uh, a bit of being a bit over long at times. Like t- I think it's ten fifteen minutes too long, and some of the scenes are a little more a little uh, yeah. a little more simplistic than I wanted to see than you see in the in the book. But that's that sometimes is the problem when you read a book before you go see in the movie is you oh, know it's always you, the problem, right? Yeah, you bring all this extra shit that you yeah. know goes on in the book, and you're like, ah, they didn't do. That. Why didn't they do that? They should have done this. You Only know, but... once have I ever felt, felt the movie was better than the book, which Ooh. is No Country for Old Men. Yes. Because the ambiguity within the character of Tommy Lee Jones, I think, was more fully realized to me because I didn't understand it at the end of the book. Right. Whereas when you see it across his face when he's looking out through his window in the blinds, yeah. and he's kind of lost of like, what, what the hell was the point? Right. Did I even make any impact? Like, you can see this across his face right. and the hollowness in his eyes of like he, he feels it as, as though there was no meaning. Yep. And something we all grapple with at certain times in our lives. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's rare. It is super rare when the, bo- the movie can even come close to the book. Yeah. Because it's just impossible. You can get into so much more lush detail in the book explaining the atmosphere, the circumstances, the characters. Right. The plot can be more complex. Like it's just an easier... It's easier to have a more enrapturing story with right. a book. Right, right, right. Agreed. Uh, at least a complex story. Right. Uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, you know, I, I didn't really get into to Grisham all that much yeah. on the literary side. Okay. Uh, you know, I told you before, you know, Crichton. Uh, yeah. Did you ever get into Clancy? No. Uh, me either. My grandpa loved them. He tried to get me onto them, and I just never... They're, they're super dense, those books. You okay. have, you have, I think you have to have an affinity for wanting to know about weapons and submarines and the machinations of those kinds of things and the espionage and intrigue because it goes levels deep like he'll, oh, yeah. he'll, he'll go a whole chapter describing how one thing works on a submarine or on a on a ship or on a, on a military vehicle and i'm like yeah i don't have that kind of interest in those kinds of things which is interesting from former military intelligence right but i didn't get in because i was super into uh, weapons i got into because i wanted to go to college and have it paid for but i you wanted uh, no secrets yeah well i slid into military intelligence because i wanted no secrets i'm yes, blowing the whistle on you <laughs> it doesn't doesn't even make sense, but I said it. So if you find something out, let me know. I will deny it. <laughs> I will deny it all categorically. Well, the problem is now we have a recording of that, so they know whatever your denial is is false. Yes, yeah, true. Your, your default preset number one is denial. Yeah, exactly. Whatever it is, you know, the Groucho, I'm against it. Don't I? Yeah, I wouldn't be part of any club that would have me as a member. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love that quote. All right, what's your number nine? Uh, my number nine is uh, the... Early, well, I don't know how early, but uh, Meryl Streep classic, Silkwood. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have that on your list? Uh, yes, I have that. Where do I have that? Let me see here. I had the list up on another, on my MacBook, and then I, uh, I it's, a, it's a punt. It's a punt. Okay. Sorry about that. Yes, that's a punt. All right, so what's your number eight? Uh, my number eight is the China Syndrome. That's my number eight. There what a surprise. Go. First time <laughs> on the list that we've had one at the same number. That's right. That is amazing. <laughs> I wonder if that will happen again. Possibly, possibly, it could happen. I That's don't know. right. You never know. Yeah, that could be a little tease. Maybe I don't. Maybe we're uh, uh, um, prognosticators. Yeah, sure. I was about to say soothsayers. Is that a soothsayer? Nostradamus? Some would say. <laughs> yes, some would say that, and those people would be wrong. Uh, come on, because if you're read Nostradamus, you can pretty much make those mean whatever you want. to. Uh, that's true. Yeah. The the lion in December roars weaker than February. You know? Oh, that's about England. Uh, okay, exactly. That's <laughs> when, you, when you people just oh so clearly this. Oh, okay, all right, sure. I'll, I have to believe you because I'm not going to sit down to take the time, right? And, and to analyze it, try all? and decipher whatever the hidden meaning could be of a guy that put himself in a, cat- a catatonic state practically and just wrote down gibberish. <laughs> Got high. Yeah, exactly. Got high. Like the, the Delphi oracles that yeah. apparently their their mysticism came bef- they sat uh, there's a geological fissure yeah. at Delphi and they sat above it and there's noxious gases that would emit from the earth. Yeah. From whatever trapped in some you know, some pocket below the earth. So these gases were coming up and these people were getting 
uh, almost like hallucinating. Yeah. Because of the lack of oxygen and whatever the hell is in the air, and they just start rambling, and people are like, well, fuck yeah, man. Yeah. We need to go to war. Yeah. There's a borderline crazy person said that, and I believe them. <laughs> Let's get on it. It's a great way to do that. Yeah. I'm so glad we don't live in ancient times. Like, are we going to go into a battle today? Let me disembowel this bunny and see what the entrails tell me. You're like, really? Yeah. That's how we're going to determine whether or not we're going into battle today? <laughs> like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> like, when uh, uh, Xerxes took on the 300, they waited for a while. Yeah. Because the, the signs weren't right. I believe that's the story. And they waited for who knows how long until the signs said, today's the day to go into battle. Right. I believe it was in, I don't know, it could be any time, you know, from those early on. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, the China Syndrome. Uh, yep. Go it's ahead. A, it, it's a early uh, Jane Fonda, Michael Douglas, but the the key component in this, and we, I know we both agree, mm-hmm. is Jack Lemmon. Yeah. Jack Lemmon is absolutely, he's amazing. Yep. And you know when I got to know Jack Lemmon, it was through like a Grumpy Old Men, and that one, um, the one where he plays the president, former president, and it's him and uh, Garner. Oh and yeah, both former president and Aykroyd is the something current president. Something the Americans or something like yeah, that. Yeah, my fellow Americans. My fellow Americans. I think is what it's called. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they all, they almost get killed because they may or may not know a secret. Yes. It's kind of this com- slapstickish comedy. Yeah. And the two of them, like that's what I knew about Lemon until I went back and saw his earlier work. Right. And it, it just the amount, the range the guy had. Yeah. To play all these different everymen. Yeah. Uh, but in this, he is he is the key cog in the the wheel of this movie. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. He's like. He's initially he wants to defend the company because he's done the right thing and he's been like he's served yeah. and and then he feels attacked by right. Jane Fonda and the exactly. news crew exactly because they're trying to break it down. and because once again this is a reporter who's coming into a situation like your job is to do this right your job is not to question what you're doing and explore yeah. the reasons why you're doing it or try to find the the flaws in what you're doing like hey you're paying me my check great i can fund my life with what you're telling me to do and i can support a family or whatever and i'm going to do this and and jane fonda's coming in what well, have you thought of this and what do you think about this and what about this and what about yeah. this and he's like initially it's it feels attacked as defensiveness is the first reaction and then eventually he starts to see the logic of what jane fonda is doing because of what happened when he saved the uh, company or the save the nuclear reactor from what was going to happen he starts to see the flaws in the way this whole thing's so much so that he flips to, he does a complete 180 well and and the people his his own workmates are now like against him and thinking he's going to ruin things or whatever. Yeah. Cause he starts thinking that Jane Fonda is attacking him. Right. That uh, she's just hell bent on shutting them down. Yeah. In reality, she's just asking simple, straightforward questions of, you know, is this as safe as we really think it right. is? Or we're told to think it is. And at first he's like, yes, like, you know, I, I, I proved that out. My team kind of, we saved the day. You don't understand how many redundancies are built into this, so something bad yeah. doesn't happen. But when he sees the the machine behind this pushing forward when there is a problem, yeah, and just like safety concerns be damned, he understands that she's not trying to ruin him. She's just trying to protect the interests of herself and everybody else because if this goes bad, yeah. it doesn't go bad by a little. It's a lot. Yeah. And now it's basically how much of a lot. Yeah. Is it just going to contaminate the surrounding areas and the, the, the fallout from this is going to kill 100 people? Yeah. Or is it going to be ultimately catastrophic and it's going to be an ICBM level you know, detonation yeah. to where now millions of people yeah. have some sort of either they're killed by it or they have radiation sickness and the cancer that comes, you know... If the truly worst could happen, yeah, it it is you know you shouldn't feel attacked. You should be asking that question yourself, right? And and we see that with like you were mentioning in an earlier version of the of this episode, like stuff that's going on in Fukushima, like all that, yeah. Uh, how how that's going to be for generations, for decades, for centuries, maybe the contamination in that area. And this film came out. We were debating whether the film came out before or after the Three Mile Island incident. Yeah, I, I thought, thought it, it was after, right? And I thought it was before. But either way, it's incredible timing for it to come out within oh, yeah. weeks of that situation. Flat happening. out amazing. Yeah, and and that I think that's what helped push that. That film more into notoriety, not just only because it was a good film, but because it was incredibly topical in its timing. Yeah, you know? exactly. I think because of the timing is the reason we know to this day, not to take anything away from the film itself, mm-hmm, but I can mm-hmm. easily see it get lost in the shuffle of 70s film because yeah. it wasn't avant-garde or trying to push the boundaries here or uh, it's a whistleblower movie. And we mm-hmm. had seen other whistleblower movies, but because it was so timely, um, yeah. it's, it's had a resonance. You know, because what other movie 
manages to deal with a topic this heavy right. and a world event exactly like that yeah. happens within a month's, you know, less than a month's time frame. Yep. Uh, so that was my number eight. Which okay. Uh, so then my number 10 is Michael Clayton. And that is a punt. Okay. All that right. That is a punt. So my number nine, then, is Citizen Four, which is the only documentary I allowed on this on my list. Uh-huh. Uh, and the reason is because I, I really enjoy this documentary, how it explores the Snowden story, right? It's, it talks about the interview, like it, it interviews, it, like it's the interview that they did with Snowden about the, all the stuff that he knew and found out about that we were doing as a government, spying on people and their phone calls and their emails and all this kind of stuff. And it's really harrowing to watch this uh, documentary and understand how deep our government went and has gone since 9-11 and the Patriot Act into, into like being involved in all of our lives and hearing everything we do. And this, yeah. it's normal human beings that are in charge charge of hearing our our worst stuff or reading our worst stuff or seeing images or videos that we send to people or post to people you know and they they get into all that and they have government approval to do yeah. all this kind of shit and so it was mind blowing to watch how deep this went because the film doesn't give you everything right all at once it no. like progressively goes through it and if you watch Snowden the movie with Joseph Gordon Levitt it does a good approximation of what the situation the situation that led up to that interview in his life and so the interview itself is what citizen four is all about and it's really incredible and it's also tense for a documentary because you don't know if they're going to get found out you don't know what they they have to put their phones in microwaves so that they they can't be tracked or found so it's all those little weird things that they do they don't turn the microwaves on obviously but it's it's something about the microwaves they're like all the shielding alone yeah it's really intense okay yeah and so it's a fascinating documentary that's why i put it number nine and he is whistleblowing on america not just a corporation the entire fucking country so i thought it was pretty incredible uh film to put there in my opinion yeah, it, it, and you know we talked about it uh, before, but in, we were both in agreement in that. Yeah. On the one hand, you don't want to see someone divulge state secrets, yeah, because it's a, it's a very slippery slope because it comes down to the morality of the person divulging it as to whether or not you agree with them and whether or not this information should be out there and could it be more detrimental to us yeah. overall. Uh, now that the world knows, as opposed to just American citizens or our government, or whatever the case is. Right. But when it's something like this that affects the entire world, and it's more invasive than... than the, it's our worst fear, fears realized. Yep. Because we assume that, that, of course, the government is going to be trying to capture as much information because we're so freely putting it out into the world. Yep. Whether it's on, you know, checking in uh, at various places across various different apps and mm-hmm. the geolocation tags of that, or, you know, on Facebook. Hey, I, you know... I. I'm going to Cabo next week. Right. You're like, oh, well, that's great. Now you just told the world and any, any, any person that may potentially be following you, you're going to be out of town for a week. Yeah, exactly. That, that, you know, that could be good information for certain individuals. Sure. Just like we're putting our lives so much out there and the fact that the government is more than likely now recording all of it. Yeah. All of it. And just storing it for what purpose? We have no idea other than to be incriminating towards us later on. Yeah. Because that's the only other reason I can think of. Yeah, yeah. Why, why else do you need all this information like about every citizen? Because yeah. you could say, oh it's, oh, it's national security and be like, pretty sure that 99.9% of this population is not a threat to the government. Yeah. And I think, I'm not sure how many nines after the decimal point it goes. Right. Like how many people realistically in the country are actively trying to do something to take out this country? Yeah. Citizens. And I'm mm-hmm. not talking about international, but citizens. What do you want to ballpark it at? Yeah. High number. Yeah. Five thousand? Uh, yeah. Okay. Ten thousand? Like guess actively so. trying to shut down our government that they would need to surveil citizens because they are a threat to the government and citizens as a whole. I, I couldn't possibly venture a guess. Yeah, I'm to, just saying. Because in my mind, it's less than that. Me too. Yeah. I'm trying to give like a liberal estimate. Yeah. Okay. Five thousand maybe. Five thousand? If that. Yeah. Actively like. Yeah. So you're going to surveil the hundreds of million. Yeah. And say it's under the guise of we're trying to protect you. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm calling bullshit. And the ridiculous nature of it is that you are investigating more the foreign people coming into this country when, in fact, it's been more uh, white people blowing up this fucking country with all their with the bombs and the attacks. It's, well, there's more white people have killed fucking their, our own citizens. Yeah, than there's any more foreign, white people, right? Than any foreign person has ever done blowing up our our people here. And so that's what's fascinating to me is like you explore how deep are you going to go down this rabbit hole? And just because they were born here doesn't mean they deserve less scrutiny. I think they deserve even more scrutiny. That's the thing. I, I do. The thing is, though, That's as an American opinion. citizen, we're not supposed to spy on our own citizens. Right, exactly. CIA is supposed to be separate from the FBI. Yes, agree. And, you know, 
unfortunately, we are supposed to afford ourselves certain liberties that we don't afford right. the rest of the world. Well, what Citizen 4 does is explore the abuse of that because you're putting it in the hands of people who are not necessarily discretionary and yeah. who they follow and who they... But they could be looking at some hot woman that they find attractive or hot dude they find attractive and they just want to fucking uh, scour their page for all their stuff, their pictures or whatever, or videos of them. Or Because you, you can turn the camera on on a computer, on the laptop, while they're in there and not know their camera is on. You can do that remotely yeah. through this. That's what... Uh, Put Snow scotch tape on my yeah. lens. Yeah. My wife asked me about it literally two weeks ago. Yeah. And she's like, is that some sort of spy thing? And I'm like, yeah, I read an article about how basically guys, even at the CIA and NSA, put scotch tape over it because anybody, if they really wanted to, could hack your laptop there and you get go. access to that camera at any time. Exactly. You're like, fuck. Yep. It's okay. crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. All right, so what's your number? So I had my number eight was the same as yours. What's your number seven? Uh, my number seven is The Constant Gardener. Ooh, good film. That is not a punt. It is number six for me, so we can talk about it. All right, perfect time to talk about it. Boom. Uh, it is, unlike the rest of the film, it's a beautiful film. Yes. It takes a lot of care in the cinematography, the color palette they choose, the edit, the stylistic way in which they tell the story. Yep. Uh, as you brought up before, it's a, you know, the nonlinear fashion of it because you're used to yeah. point A to point B in these films. Yeah. And it's like, because the timeline is so important. Mm-hmm. When did you find out certain bits of information? Right, right. And with this is it flashes backwards and forwards because you need to set up the character dynamic between Ray Fiennes and Rachel Weisz uh, to understand the motivation of why they ultimately get to where they get to, mm-hmm. at least the film as an overall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it's just, it's really beautiful. Yeah. Because the, the choice of the uh, turning Kenya itself, which is where we believe it was, is set, into a character within the film itself. Yeah. And the juxtaposition within the film of these beautiful settings and the horrific things that happened there. Yeah. And, uh, well, say again what you said about uh, Rachel Weiss's character. Well, because she's a bombastic character. She's more, she's like, she pulls no punches. She's an emotional character. But then at the same time, she's like very uh, uh, quiet and silent and he has trouble reaching her. And so t- I think the country mirrors what she is. And so for him, when he's exploring what happened to his wife, how she died and how she was murdered, he's going on this whole journey. And when he's down in the country, he is having these flashbacks because the country reminds him of her. Yeah. And so that's, I find that fascinating. Because Ray Fiennes rarely does these restrained characters. It's almost like I was comparing it to Gary Oldman and Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy. Yeah. They don't do necessarily these like restrained, slow moving characters. And you brought up how Danny Houston comes and admits this stuff to him and he thanks yeah. him for it. Like, yeah, he understands Danny Houston's that, struggle. I know that must have been hard for you. Yeah. And that that tells you everything you need to know about the character that Ray Fiennes is portraying right. in one sentence. Yep. That is beautiful writing Mm -hmm. because at the start of that scene is he is doing what he more than likely does every day. He starts by watering his plants. Yeah. He got to the office and he's just doing that. And Houston walks in and saying, I have some news to tell you. By the way, this is the opening scene, not the scene between these two, but the the opening scene he's describing, which is Rachel Weisz dying. Yeah. That is the opening scene of the movie. It was in the trailer. Yep. Um, So we're not spoiling anything because that's, you know, that, that is the start of the movie. Um, and he needs he needs Ray Fiennes to to pull his attention away from the world that he's created. This also this micro world of I deal with my plants and this is where I feel safe and kind of comfortable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Houston tells him, uh, you know, I think your wife is dead. Yeah, and it, you know, stiff upper lip. He just he takes it in stride, and the that must have been hard for you. And Houston looks more heartbroken. Yeah. He's showing more emotion across his well, face. Well, because he had a feelings for her, too. Yeah, that's yeah, true. He had that, you know, he had an attraction for her. And I, does she cheat on him? I don't remember if she oh, cheats on him. Remember. Yeah, I don't remember if she cheats on him. I think something happens, but I'm I not think sure. So. I think you're right. Yeah. Because he suspects that it's the driver, and right. the driver turns out to be uh, gay. Yeah. So there is no threat there. But right. But it might have been with Houston. Yeah. Or maybe they had a fleeting something that never went anywhere, but right. there was like a mutually expressed between the two of them. I can't yeah. remember I think there was something. And so even that he forgives because he loves her that much and yeah. still wants to find out what happened. And you find out that she got involved in this pharmaceutical company doing these things that were really corrupt. And so it's all the whole thing is the, is the exploration of it. And I had to watch it two or three times to really get it because 
it does kind of unsettle you in terms of the way he does the film, the poetry nature of the film, the, the oh, sorry, the poetic nature of the film, and the way he jumps back and forth in time with the flashbacks. They're so uh, they take they come out of they, at times they come out of weird times, and so you have to kind of follow along and are you, well, you piecing it together? Yeah, you readjust exactly because you and jump that's back really and you're like, oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah. we're back to a couple years ago. Exactly, <laughs> the first time they do it, you're like, oh, oh, shit. All right, all right. Right. Okay. You catch like you up. You get it, and then the next time they do it, you realize it's a recurring theme. Yeah. But it helps uh, more expand and educate the viewers as to the love and the bond that they've created. Yeah. Because yeah. what you said, you know, just a second ago about the fact that he's willing to forgive whatever sin she may have had because he loves her for her faults. Right. For her flaws. Because right. they're attracted to one another being opposite individuals. She is impassioned and has a strong opinion, whereas he is a low-level diplomat that is willing to settle. His life right. is consolation. Right. So he, but, you know, he's willing to forgive those sins because he is appreciative of the time that they had together, and that, to him, meant more than anything. Yeah, exactly. Like, you may have had that, but I know she loved me. Yeah. And I loved yeah. her. There you go. Right, yeah. exactly. She may have had that with you, and that's fine, mm-hmm. but... At the end of the day, ultimately, I know that we loved each other more than any two people, mm-hmm. any other person in the world. Right. And that is an overriding. I choose to remember that than this yeah. fleeting information that I just got now. Because it, every experience I've had before this trumps that. And I respect that. Uh, um, I respect that, Matt, because I, uh, that's something I've struggled with uh, my whole life in relationships. Like, that whole idea of understanding. It's more, I was more about, like, why aren't you doing this? Or why don't you do this? Or why don't you show me you care in this way? And when I watch movies now, having gone through what I've gone through, it's really interesting now to watch them in retrospect. To be like, the, the, the blueprints have been there for decades in movies. And yeah. I just didn't listen. I didn't understand. I didn't watch and get it. And now I get it. And it's so interesting when you can be, when you love someone, it's about, being patient and accepting who they are. True. It's not about you need to do this to show me. You no. need to and and those those are the traps. I was still very giving and considerate and caring as a partner, but I wasn't always I was lost in my insecurities and so I was always like how you need to show me you care about me. You need, I'm 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 suspicious. I'm suspicious. And th- this is when you watch a movie like this you understand that when you love someone there is no pride, there is no who's dominant, who's submissive. It's about Showing it's actual teamwork. affection, it's teamwork, right? Exactly, and yeah. so this this kind of film is always so powerful in that way for me because it's like, oh shit, I why didn't I see that before? And it's fascinating. It's so interesting. So it's a great for great film, and she won the Oscar for it. You know, a little because um, the relationship I have with my wife is the longest relationship I've ever had. Yeah. Um, one thing that helped us immensely. So if you ever get into a long term, and it's something I didn't do before. Yes. Yeah. The longest relationship I had went six months, and I had it a couple times. Wow. And everything else was short term because. Right. I liked relationships that failed. Yeah. I genuinely did. I went into it going, yeah, you know, she's a little this, she's yeah. a little that. I created an excuse from the very first time. Right. So when it ended a month, two months later, I was like, yeah, I always knew it would. That's right. fine. I, we enjoyed each other's company when we had it and moved on. Right. Uh, and did it continuously. But um, every once and again, I, I will stop and be like, okay, what's, what's one thing I can do that's really easy, but it would make a world of difference to you? Yeah. But you would like, I, I appreciate the living shit out of it. If like... Uh, mine was uh, if and when I get home because when she gets home and I'm home, mm-hmm. I try and put down whatever I'm doing and go in, give her a hug and a kiss, and ask her how her day was and just right. interact. Yes, just to say like that. Leave all that at the door, mm-hmm. and I'm here for you. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it'll be great if you know. Some nights I know you're tired, but if you could do that for me every once in a while, right? And not saying you don't, but I know that it makes me happy every time you do it, right? And uh, at first she was like, oh, like I, she was almost I wouldn't say defensive, yeah. Um, but she wasn't, but she was like, she started doing it and she could, she could tell how much she enjoyed it yes. by seeing the reaction that I got. Right. And there've been times where I've taken it for granted and I apologize. I'd be like, I know that I asked you to do that. And sometimes I forget that, that you do go out of your way to, to make me feel right. loved. Right. And I just want you to know that I recognize that just like stupid little things. Like yeah. communication is the ultimate key. Well, uh, communication is never my, I can, uh, you know, I always tell what I want and what, the, what I, the, the problem is that I, I think I went, I chose people who were not necessarily ready to be in a situation like that and okay. have that. And I put expectations on them that, um, they, that I shouldn't have because they weren't ready to be what I needed them to be or what I wanted to have in a relationship. Sure. And I stuck around longer because I didn't have the strength within myself to walk away from it and think I'll find the right person. Uh, the next person might be the right person. This is not the right person at the right time. Yeah. And so I, I, I'm always a, a fan of trying to make it work as opposed to being like, hey, 
it just isn't working at this not the right time and to move on so those are the things you learn as i get old so I, I love that i have the knowledge now you're it's a fighter just, yeah i really am always have been my whole life is that so you know uh but you learn now as you get older the situations that to not you be in you you learn to accept your faults exactly and you just be like you know what unfortunately that's the way i process things and as much as i'd like to change it that is just one of my things yeah yeah. And please, you know, I, I can work to change other things. Yeah. But that is one of my, like, I'm sorry, that's my default. Right. right. So it's nothing against you. That's just who I am. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, Hopefully, you, you know, find somebody that ultimately accepts you for who you are. Otherwise, right. you know, why settle? Exactly. And that's what's so great to be in this place now is I've finally understood that. It's so great. I mean, who knows if it'll happen, but it's nice to at least understand it. So, yeah. Well, the question is, can you tie down the outlaw? You know what I mean? Because <laughs> you always envision that guy yeah. out on the range. Yeah, he is. Just breaking hearts That's right. all across the West. <laughs> and breaking you, in horses. Yeah, yeah right. you breeze into town. There he is. Who's that rogue? Who's uh, that, you know, that rock on tour? That's right. That guy out there, <laughs> like Kung Fu, just traveling the countryside. What you mean, walk to earth? Right, <laughs> right, in, right in the wrongs of this world. That's right. That's right. Yeah, out there. I don't know. Mm. Will the outlaw settle down? I have outlaw. no idea. I don't know. By the way, guys, I had another great uh, addition to the Halloween costume for Outlaw, but I, oh. think, I think the Outlaw himself shot it down. What's, uh, what's, what's that? Which was the addition of the fan-made wand. Oh, yes. To replicate that. So now we have wand, trident, monocle <laughs> on top of V for Vendetta, Guy Fox Max. Uh, not, plus not, cowboy hat. Uh, yeah, plus cowboy hat. There's a, there's a lot of accessories to this, <laughs> this, outfit, this Halloween outfit. It'd be like $75. See, I kind of get the feeling, though, the more you embellish it, the better the character is. Probably. Uh, yeah, uh, I think his name is Scott Salisbury. He <laughs> made a wand for me, and so it was really kind of him to do so. At first, I thought you were saying, like, his name, like you were giving the, the outlaw a name. Like oh, the no, character Scott Salisbury, has that's his name. A, an e- like, the, the, the alter ego has an alter ego. It's a hat on the hat type of situation. I was like, oh, shit, the wormhole goes deeper. <laughs> Maybe that's what it says across the top of the packaging uh, on this Halloween costume. I wouldn't put you through that. In no <laughs> way would I put you through that. <laughs> it's a lot to remember. It's a lot to remember. Yeah, but I think that's his name, uh, Scott Salisbury. He, I, he, a few weeks ago, he brings us candy here at, uh, at Collider, but a few weeks ago he's like, I want to um, make a wand because you worked at Harry Potter. You worked in the in the land there, and I uh, want to make something for. He's Scott Salisbury. That is his name, Scott Salisbury. And and I, he's like, "What kind of wand do you want?" And I said, "I want something with thick wood and steel because I like the Mad Eye Moody wand because it's a combo of that. It's heavy. I like a, a heavy wand." And so he made this wand for me in his shop. Okay. And he put these uh, symbols around the wand, the tip of the uh, the um, tip of the handle of the wand. It says ATB ATR, which is all the belts, all the records, in like a rune symbol. That's pretty amazing, and so it, it is. It's a it's a it's a hefty wand. It is, yeah. And so uh, I have it sitting on my desk now uh, here at Collider, and I love it. It's a, it was a very sweet gesture by Scott, and you know he's like, don't tell people to to tweet me to to for me to make them something because I don't have the time. And the last time someone did that, I was overwhelmed with requests, and I felt bad turning people down. So give me credit, say you enjoyed it. That's all, and I'm like, great. Yeah, that's exactly. Because you could tell that the amount of care that he put into it. Oh yeah. I can't imagine trying to turn around and have to. Uh, uh, I've done woodworking. Yeah. And when you add the metal into it, I don't know how much of how much he had to, to fashion himself. Mm-hmm. But the wood is nicely done. The runescapes are carved into it. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really excellent work. Yep. I, I still like the idea that it, you got it for retirement from <laughs> Universal. From <laughs> Universal. They, they, every wand keeper that does, <laughs> works there long enough when they leave, visit their gold watch. <laughs> and they have a ceremony, and like the kids are all there and be like, I'm off to retirement to the muggle world. I'm off to retirement and muggle world. I'm yeah. going to sit around in Florida. <laughs> Is that your accent? No, it's, it's not. It's the worst accent yeah, ever. I was no. going to say, I was like, wow, that's a, a Cockney meets no, uh, that's my conductor Mary accent. Poppins. That's my conductor accent. That's right your conductor? Yeah, we have to do Cockney when you do conductor. So it's, well, all, well, it's Express. All Come right, on well, in. Give, give me wand keeper. What do we got for wand keeper? Wand more British. More British. Well, but posh? Well, Welcome to Ollivanders, makers of fine wands. I am the wand keeper, and you have all come to witness a wand fitting. You are most welcome. Being selected by an Ollivanders wand, no matter the age, is a magical experience. So that was it, and it goes on for a little bit longer. So there you go. Thank you. It was very well, kind the best of part you. is you were delivering that as if you were in the room. Yes. Because you were darting your eye around, your eyes around, rather, to make eye contact with whatever little kids. Plus, you were looking down as mm-hmm. opposed to looking up at the adults. Right. Because that's who you're selling to. You had yes. nice, nice hand movements, but Thank it wasn't you. too over top to distract. No. Facial expressions were money in the bank. After a year and a half, you perfected, and you're looking around that level because you're looking to see what kid you're going to pick. 
that's uh-huh. the that's the cheat of the opening monologue is you are looking to see which child you're going to pick and once you select them in your mind you can still finish the monologue and then you avert your eye go oh what have we here? I sense a magical energy from you. You've come to fit your world. And then you bring them forward and do the whole thing. So it's great. Does any fun. kid ever get so excited they like relieve themselves in their back? No, not relieved. They usually cry okay. or get really emotional or get super happy or they completely shut, shut down. down. Yeah. And then afterwards you hear that they were crazy excited when they left the room in the wand shop. They finally got to let go of yeah, the Yeah, they got to enjoy the, the moment as exactly. opposed to... Oh, I hope I'm good. Oh my god, right. I, I can't believe I'm in the middle. Like, why? Oh, everybody's looking at me. Right. That's what shuts them down. I didn't understand that the first couple of months. I was like, why are these kids shutting down? Why are these kids god, like? Kids, I, I kids like, rightly so. Mm-hmm. You, you get forget into a situation they never even remotely thought of. Right. Oh, now you need to perform in front of how many ever strangers? Are Thirty-five in this people in a room, right? Exactly. Looking it's right gotta, at you. Got to be terrifying. Yeah. Exactly. How many kids? You know. Or like, I'm a star. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there are loads of those, there too. There were a few of those Yeah, but who, who I, made the show about themselves. The yeah. shy kid is, has to be the most common. Yes. At least, yeah, it what was. I'm assuming. Usually, most of the time, yes. Uh, all right, so where are we at now? Yeah, I lost track. Where are we at? Uh, we just did Constant Gardener, yeah, right? Constant Gardener. So we're up to your number five. No, we haven't done my number six. Oh, what's your number six? Have we done? We haven't done your seven and six, correct? Well, we yeah. I don't. Well, we talked about Silkwood. Or, we haven't talked about Silkwood. We have not. Okay, so all right. So we do my number six. What's your number six? Well, we I already know the outcome of this. <laughs> Is on the waterfront. We're punting. We are punting. You bastard! I still, that's something we haven't gotten to. I have my reasons. That's right. We're we haven't gotten to, to that. Hey, are, there's still virgin territory out there somewhere. There's all kinds of kinds of magic in the top five. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> So then my number oh, seven. That it, sounds like another show for the network. Oh. There's all kinds of magic in the top five. And we Boom. Our best moments from the top five of shows. God, that's, that's perfect. Sounds like we got at least three clip show channels. That's, that's the 11 o'clock <laughs> show. That's the 11 o'clock at night show. It's just a recap of the and day's in, events. Until we get infomercials coming in and paying us for it because the advertisers aren't paying us diddly shit for those hours. <laughs> I'm James Wan. This is my uh, le- this is my asphalt that can turn into rubber. It's amazing. Blah 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 blah. Here on the top ten network. I hate those guys. Uh, all right, so yeah, you got to make a dollar. I guess those guys make six figures doing that shit. Oh, they make more than that, depending. Probably. Oh, yeah, right. you, know, you don't think Billy Mays made seven oh, figures? Mays made seven figures. Yep. And that other guy. Nobody got, gets that excited about OxyClean. Who, who's the guy that got beat up in in Florida that was doing the Swiffer, the Magic, whatever that guy? Oh, that uh, blonde uh, dude. What's his What's he, his name? He was uh, Sham Wow. Sham Wow. Yeah, he was making a shit ton. He of used cash, to come that to guy. the store. Oh, really? Yeah. Was he a stand-up? Uh, no, he he fashioned himself as a funny person. <laughs> that dude is a creepy son of a bitch. Uh, I only met him passing a handful of times. Yeah. One of my buddies, uh, he took a shine to. Yeah. And my friend was like, "I got no problem talking to you. Right. Let's do this all day." Because, uh, you know, you're crazy, so there's yeah. only going to be good stories coming out of this. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that dude is a real piece of work. I bet he is. He's a... I bet he is. Uh, so, anyway, number seven is, is Silkwood, uh, which was a punt from your earlier. What, would you have it at number eight? Nine? Nine. Nine. All right. So, a couple of uh, uh, notches above. Great film, Meryl Streep. Yeah. Cher, uh, Kurt Russell. Yeah. Uh, who else do we have in that film? David Strathern. Number of people. Bruce McGill played the guy who runs the play. So just a lot of interesting stuff going on in that film. And I'm, I'm not usually the uh, this one was one I had to kind of be forced to come to because I enjoy Meryl Streep. But I didn't think this film was necessarily the one that was going to you know put me over the edge to go watch uh, this kind of film and Meryl Streep film. And damn, if I, 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 I really enjoyed it. She was great in this film. Like she's like she's almost like Jack Lemmon in China Syndrome. She's just this woman who like is unassuming, doing her thing. And, like, uh, she gets turned around and starts to, like, she gets along with everybody else. And then she uh, sees what's going on, what the company is doing and what they're kind of uh, indirectly making the workers responsible for. And so she starts to become the mother bear starts to come out of protecting the people that she cares about, gets yeah. along with, but then they kind of turn on her and she has to deal with those stuff. And then she's physically intimidated well, and all this kind of shit. So. They perceive her to be taking away their jobs yep. and that's their overriding factor as opposed to the long-term damages of being around plutonium and uranium. Yeah. Which, yep. Good point. You know, the government is stepping in or the, the company that they, she works for and saying, hey, no, everything's fine. Yeah. You're within acceptable limits. And there hadn't been enough uh, studies and trials to know, at that point, I don't think the body of work was long enough to say with any kind of certainty yeah. how much plutonium and uranium a person could be around before right. it's a lethal dose. That's a good point. I'm sure they had some science behind it, obviously, mm-hmm. but 
to definitively say one way or the other, it seems rather premature considering the nuclear bomb is only 30 years old at this right, point. Right, right. So I don't know if 30 years is long enough time to figure all that out. I don't think it is. Yeah, I would imagine you need a couple generations to figure out because once you uh, sever those atoms, the byproducts of them, the, the radioactive elements have half-lives. Yeah. Thousands upon thousands of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's still destructive to the human body. It just destroys your cells. Mm-hmm. So... To, after 30 years, be like, no, we know the precise amount seems premature. Yeah, to say the least. Yeah, and they all take it, you know, yes, they're aware of it, of right. the, the harm, but at the same time, they're not. Right. And once once it's presented to her and it's illuminating, she does. She flips from being the person that, that is out there to be jovial and liked and, and mm-hmm. you know, be everybody's friend, yeah. which she is. She's not trying. She is everybody's friend. You're right. Friend. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Uh, now she goes into this protective mode of herself, self-preservation, but also of those around her. Be like, I'm worried for you, too. Yeah, yeah. You should be concerned with this because I, I don't feel that they're on the up and up. And even if they are, a little more oversight is not a bad thing for right. us. Right, exactly. And for the American people at large because what they're doing is turning into pellets, and those pellets get turned into fuel rods, and the fuel rods get used in nuclear power plants. That's right. what they submerge, and that's where you get the chain reactions from and all that shit Yeah, uh, where we generate the heat that – Cooks the water that makes steam that turns the turbine. Right. Thank you, China syndrome, because it'd be a quick <laughs> breakdown in that. Uh, but that is, it's so weird that we have to do, you know, nuclear fission to tear atoms apart to boil water yeah. at a crazy efficient level to turn a turbine. <laughs> it, it seems as though there's got to be a better way to capture the energy, but at the same time, it's like, the smartest minds came up with this. Yeah, so, so I shouldn't question it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, fusion is a different animal. We haven't gotten to fusion yet. You know, right. That's what the sun does. And if we can figure that out, that's even better. Oof. Yeah. It's, it's a better energy source. The, the byproducts, I believe, are not nearly as bad. Right. Um, but anyway. So, yeah. Uh, uh, so they turn into the fuel rods, and then turns out there might be malfeasance on their end in the fuel rods because they yeah. could be pushing some through inspection because there's a contract, and that contract is due, and they're already behind, so they're getting pressure from the financial aspect of it. Yeah. And, and she's asking them to be like, put the financials aside. You need to think about the human cost right. in this because that's ultimately more valuable than, than the financial. But the people that are pushing the monetary aspect don't live in the town. Right. So they don't have to deal with the fallout. No, of course, of course not. And that's what, like, we were discussing this earlier. You said is that they just see them as uh, numbers on a page yeah. instead of human beings with actual costs, like what we see happening in Flint, Michigan. Same thing. These are corporations that come in and they take advantage of lower in- low income areas and they, and they see them as just um, acceptable losses, acceptable lawsuits, acceptable uh, um, PR, bad PR yeah. in exchange for making the amount of money that they want to make. It's and and Ed that's Norton what I Fight find. Club. Yeah, yeah, exactly. An insurance adjuster that goes out, and then once there's enough fatal car accidents from yeah. this defect, if you assume that the civil lawsuit that's coming is going to be larger, it's a class action, right? Uh, then it would cost you to either pull everything off or retrofit or do whatever to correct the problem. That's yeah. when you tip the scales and you go that direction. And it sucks because there's a, a cost benefit or right. a cost, you know, expense ratio there that they're doing a calculus with human lives yeah. and equating it to dollar signs. It's like a, in a settlement. If you, if you get into a car accident and it's a car the manufacturer's fault yeah. and you lose a leg, there's a monetary value that's assigned to that leg for the average person. Right. And then they just go, okay, well, you would have made this in your job, or if it doesn't affect your job, say you sit at a desk or something, then the monetary value of a leg, if a person your age being deprived of it for X number of years right. is X. Yeah. You're like, Jesus, man. It's worth more than whatever insignificant you know, currency you assign yeah. to it. It's my fucking leg. That is priceless. Yeah. It's just weird that, that someone has sat down yeah. and done the algebra on that. Just right. Like, nope. That's what it is. That's Jesus. what the accounting, you know, rings up as. Man. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> it's just so cold. Yeah. It's the uh, you intense. know it's the Stalin um, quote of of one death is a tragedy, a, mo- a million is a statistic because yeah. you can't wrap your brain around a million, whereas yeah. one is personal and individual. Right. Yeah. Uh, all right, and then that's uh, that was my number seven, right? So uh-huh. then we talked about number six already with Constant Honor. So what's your number five? Oh, uh, my number five is where we catch the show back up. Aaron Hey-o. Brockovich. Yeah, Aaron Brockovich. That's my number five. Now I want to see. I want to see if this is a Candyman situation. Are you gonna go just back and- saying her name somehow <laughs> forces the hard drive off, and she's like, "No, Julia Roberts." Maybe. I hate Julia Roberts. I fucking hate Julia Roberts as an actress. I just don't enjoy her in a lot of films. 
But Aaron Brockovich, she is damn good in this movie. And Soderbergh, as I was saying to you before, Soderbergh knows how to direct women in his films to, to show their strengths and vulnerabilities at the same time and make them interesting, complex characters, just like she did with, he did with J-Lo or uh, Jennifer Lopez in Out of Sight. This is, uh, to me, this is Julia Roberts' best performance in anything. And she won the Oscar for it. I didn't think she deserved it. I thought Ellen Burstyn deserved it for Requiem for a Dream. I think what was asked of her was deeper and more powerful. But you can't deny Julia Roberts' a magnanimity in this, yeah. in this part, in this role. But at the same time, Julia Roberts had to carry the entire film. It's and what Ellen I'm Burstyn did not. Right, right. Because you could say that also about Jennifer Connelly. In Requiem for a Dream. She's great in Requiem she for a Dream. She is, and the, her storyline is brutal when it gets yeah. to the end of what she's managing to suffer yep. in order just to get some more drugs. Ugh, that scene. All of them in that movie. That scene. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, but in this, uh, Brockovich, so she uncovers um, a scandal within an energy company. I can't remember the initials of the energy company. Yeah. But it's in a small California town. and um, She stumbles upon it because she... she Got into, like, an accident or something, and then Albert Finney was her lawyer, and she loses the case because it was her own fault. Right. And then she goes to his office and basically says, uh, you know, look, I'm, I, I need a job. Yeah. I need a job. And he, yeah. he takes pity on her. He gives her a job, you know? It's like, all right. Well, Much I, of the chagrin of the office. Like, a lot of the people didn't yeah. want her to come on well, and get a job. because she's dressed. Yeah. She, like, she's flaunting it all times. For lack of a better term, she's a bit of a white trash person. For lack of a better term. For mm-hmm. like, don't get mad at me. For lack, lack of a better term. There's, there's, uh, there's uh, brown trash, white trash, uh, Latino trash. There's all kinds of trash. So there's trash within every gender or every race. So well, look, please. If you're her age and you're showing your boobs off that much, yeah. you need to be a waitress at Hooters <laughs> or... Wow. Okay. Well, I'm just saying, like, she's putting her boobs on full display. Right, they were. Like, they're in yep. halter. Well, she's working with what tops. she got. She's working with what she got. And what she has is yeah, amazing. Yeah, that's yeah, true. I'm not taking it away from sure, her. Sure, sure. But when it's like, I got to pick my kids up from soccer. Yeah. Why the fuck do you need to look like this every second of every day? That's true. That's a good point. Why are you selling sex well, when you're going to pick up a loaf of bread? Some people feel comfortable finding their fi- they find their confidence in their sexuality. Tease some their people. own. Yeah, and true. The rest of our society was like, man, it seems like a bit much. <laughs> That's a fair We're point. We're all sitting off the sides judging, going, eh, you know, you kind of leave that childish <laughs> shit behind you eventually. We, we still have that prudish nature. And you're right. And you're right. And because some people aren't, you know. No, they are. Yeah. I, uh, I guess. It is being prudish, but at the same time, I think it's just kind of growing up. Well, I, I agree with you to a degree. Like that's the thing, because you, 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 if you want to convey a professional atmosphere, you got to, uh, or you yeah. want to convey a professional, you got to have a professional look. Exactly. Right? And, and kind of how you present yourself to the world, you know, whether or not you want to admit it, yeah. is how the world, you know, perception is reality. Right. So they perceive you to be non-professional, someone right. that's not taking the the. The situation that we're currently in, serious enough. Well, and I think that's the journey she goes on through the film, too, for sure. herself, right? This idea of having to compromise and her going, why do I need to compromise to do this or that? Or why, it, should, it should only matter what I, how smart I am or my abilities. And eventually she realizes, like, and people start to believe her. People start to see that her way of doing things, although unorthodox, works for this situation. Yeah. And, and keeps the company that she's going up against off balance at all times because they're not they're used to dealing with people who handle things in a certain way because that's how people have always handled things in a certain way against them. She throws them off kilter and is why she's able to succeed or a big reason why she's able to succeed in what she's doing with almost with little to no uh, background in the legal world. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and she manages to get the entire town and people that worked for the company itself. Yeah. To come over to the side of the class action exactly. lawsuit. Exactly, yeah, pretty that, amazing. You know, that takes a, a tremendous intelligence yeah. of people. Yep. Which is, you know, it's a different type of IQ. Yep. Uh, so that's not to be discredited. It's just, you know, if, if it, it, yeah, okay, it doesn't matter. We already covered all those topics. <laughs> just, I was about to rehash the exact same thing, and I was like, why? Yeah. We do not need to do that. All right. So we're moving on. We are moving on. All right. So what's your number four? My number four is a little punt from you earlier. Oh, which is? Michael, Michael Clayton. Wow, that high. I just like that movie a yeah, lot. Yeah, this is the thing, Matt, for me. I, 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 and I'm, I'm also gonna, you're going to talk about it in length. For me, I understand how good this film is. Like, aesthetically, acting-wise, storyline, everything. But for some reason, I can't 100% connect to it. It's one of the most distant films I've ever seen George Clooney do. And it's hard for me because I want to love it as much as everybody else loves it. And for me, I just can't get in there enough. But I put it on my list because I know it's a damn good movie. But I think 
that or therein lies the point. Yeah. Because he's almost going against Clooney type. He's not playing the uber charming George no, Clooney. No. He's playing a guy that you don't much care for. Right. Because he's a fixer in essence. He's a wolf for hire. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's you know, oh, like he's in the middle of a poker game. Mm-hmm. He gets called out because a client of the law firm that he works for is in trouble and he basically needs to make this thing go away. Right. And that's the type of doesn't matter you can call me. They pay him very well for it. Yeah. But at the same time, that also means his morality is utterly compromised by the dollar. Yep. If you're willing to pay me enough, it seems as though he's willing to do whatever you need done. Exactly. And they give him what looks to be a hefty salary. And he's also in debt because of his brother. Yeah. And he gets in with a loan shark. Right. And he's got money due over there. And I, I, I liked it because I was already a fan of George Clooney at that sure. point. And he plays a character that is unlike, I think, basically everything he had done up until that point. Yeah, yeah. So it was just kind of seeing a different gear from George uh, from George Clooney, right? Whereas the American is something a lot of people can't connect to or under. Or, He's disconnected in that. Yeah, and I love that film. I love him in that movie, and I actually connect to his character more in this in that movie than I do in Michael Clayton. So I, it's just a matter of taste, subjective taste. Like, and I know a lot of people love this film and love him in this movie. You know, so yeah. I feel terrible that I don't feel more for it. I'm actually looking forward to revisiting the American in a couple of years. Mm. Uh, just in that now I'll appreciate the Italian countryside and the oh, setting so right. much more. It's just going to make me long to go back there. Right. Because I, I do it even now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the other day I got an email. It was last, like, Wednesday. Uh-huh. I opened up my email and uh, used the company in Rome to go to the Vatican and see the Sistine Chapel. Oh, sweet. Take a, a tour of the Vatican Museum, and mm-hmm. you don't even see all of it. Right. There's just too much to see. Yeah. But it was like, one year ago today, you were in the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> Here's some cool things we got going in other parts of the world. And you're like, oh, you motherfucker. Uh, uh, I was there a year ago and shit, and the day after that, and, you, and then I, that was the beginning of the trip. It right. was like day five, right. day four. We were there for a while. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit, man, we went to this and had this amazing, and right. fuck, I loved it, you know? We were in Rome so long one day, we were at the Trevi Fountain. It was the second time we had been there, but we were just like, oh, we wanted to try this restaurant over in the area. Mm-hmm. And we were over there, and uh, I had read a bunch of different articles about pickpockets in oh. Italy and what to look out for. Right. So my wife and I just stood off in the middle of the crowd and tried to spot the pickpockets <laughs> and ended up tailing a group of what we think were young pickpockets. Jesus. Yeah, just to see, like, see if they pulled it off anywhere else, where they went. Be careful, it was man. fun. I'm sure. It was like a spy movie. We were just like, we would trade off, and the other one would take the lead for a while, so they never got too comfortable. We <laughs> followed them for like 40 minutes. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you're in Italy for a month. I guess so. It was so much fun, because we had been in Rome for like six days at that point, point. we were leaving the next day, and we are right. like, let's do this. <laughs> Why not? We've seen so many things here. This is something totally different. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so tell me why you love the film so much. Michael Clayton, just, just for all those things, the, yep. the performance is... Do you, you like know, the story, though? Top to bottom? Right. The story is very much a whistleblower film. Right. It doesn't really surprise you with the nuts and bolts of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it surprises you that a guy like Clooney, who is paid to be the... All of a sudden grows a conscience. I it's that one line too far. He crosses that one line too far, right? Do you or think no? he grows a conscience or he sees that basically if he doesn't grow a conscience, they're going to kill him? Sure. Oh, that's an interesting... So he's kind of, of that way. self-preservation motivated. Okay. He can hide behind the high-minded, I need to save these people. But it's also like, well, if that doesn't succeed, then I'm dead because right. I'm more of a liability alive. Yeah. Even if this secret never gets out because I'm one more person that knows it and I shouldn't. Yeah. So I'm fine with his motivations because right. I think it seems, it seems true to the character to me. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Yeah. Uh, who knows? Yeah. Maybe I need to go back cause I haven't seen it in a couple of years. Right. But I know I have seen it. What when did it come out? Like 2009, yeah, yeah, yeah. 2011, yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah. I've already seen it a number of times. Yeah. Which for a movie, you know, not that old, it, Pretty good, which means I'll probably watch it again a few more times over yeah. the rest and, of my life. And probably. Tilda Swinton, is, she won the Oscar for this. She's fantastic in the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Tom Wilkinson's in the movie, too, right? He is. He's the guy that has the snaps that uh, right. basically where uh, uh, Clooney finds out yeah. the you know underhanded nature of the company, what the company's trying to protect. Right, right. Yeah. So okay. I, I, mean, I thought it was a damn good film. <laughs> okay, that's a damn good film. <laughs> All right, so my number four uh, then is The Insider. Punt. Woo! That was swift. 
That is a punt. That's a swift punt. It is, right. especially near the top. Yeah, all right. So what's your number three? Uh, my number three, I wonder, okay, so we got, Ooh. all right, so I think I know your final four. You, you think you know. I know. I, I know. Okay, fine. Uh, my number three is Serpico. That's my number two. Perfect time. Fucking Serpico. Such a goddamn good movie. It's impressive because they spend the first, like, 45 minutes just kind of getting to know Serpico. Yes! Like, you see the graft, but it's really about getting to know this guy, and it succeeds. Yeah, man. And it shouldn't. Mm-hmm. You should not spend that much time setting up, but you kind of have to. Yeah. To understand the character and why he's really not even going against the grain. He's, he's more so like, why can't I just do my job? Right. Why, 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 why? So we, we take money because everybody takes money and they've always taken money. So right. we have to take money. And I'm a shitty person because I'm not breaking the law. Right. Like that, that does not compute. They sus- cops, cops suspect him mm-hmm. of being uh, unloyal, uh, unloyal because he won't be crooked like they are uh, yeah, and corrupt threat. like they are. They, they see him as a threat, right? Instead of him, he could have just kept doing the job, not taking the money. If they could have just accepted, he doesn't want to do the, take the money and he, they'll do their jobs. Yeah. But they are all, they was afraid that he was going to turn on them eventually and turn them all in. you right. A with internal affairs or whatever. And so you have all this going on and it's one of Pacino's, it's one of my favorite performances of Pacino because he's not doing his stuff that he did in Godfather or anything else or in, or in Dog Day Afternoon. Like, he's legitimately this earnest guy who just wants to do his job, like you said, Matt. Yeah. And all this other shit just keeps working against him, and they set him the fuck up. And what happens to him? Man, I remember, dude, I saw this when I was a kid. I was probably seven or eight or nine years old when I saw this movie on TV. And when that moment happens. Wow, really? Yeah, yeah. I think I was that. I think on it, TV? No yeah, less. yeah. It was like, uh, yeah, it was like one of those like Saturday afternoon movies that I was watching. Holy That's shit. how I watched French Connection. That's how I watched all. I was so into all these like 70s grittier. Oh, just because they'd have to edit out the boobs, but then. Cursing, yeah, but they, they they would always do other words, or they would do uh, blank. They would drop the noise out or the sound out, and so I was. And, and when that moment happens, dude, I remember that that was a moment that fucked me up because it was this whole idea of the nobility of this guy and his own friends turn on him or workmates turn on him to set him up to almost uh, have that thing happen yeah. to him. And I thought what they what happens to him actually happened to him and then you find out that he actually survived it and you're just like, "Oh man." So like to me I remember that from from behind how he falls backwards and yeah. you're just like, "Holy shit." And it goes to black and then you're like, "You don't know what happens." And then but it's just so it was such a depressing film, but I love that about the seventies films. They they didn't take they didn't pull any punches in no. showing the darkness of what's going on. Uh, uh, with people who are wearing a badge, you know? Well, I mean, but that's what a whistleblower movie is. Yep. Is here's the underside, and here's the plan of attack and trying to change it. Sometimes that works, and sometimes that doesn't. Yeah, yeah. And you feel it within the character numerous times, like when he gets his uh, gold badge. Yeah. And he becomes a detective, and it's after he's been shot in the face. And he's (sighs) like, did I get this? Because I wouldn't compromise myself in essence right or did i get it because i was shot in the face and i survived yeah when they were trying to set me up to die yep yeah man that's brutal yeah my but- favorite my favorite part <laughs> there's two is so how tall is al pacino five four yeah something like that five maybe five, five four. four five five with scoliosis like posture yeah because his shoulders he's always hunched, yeah so far over, but you can see it a lot in this because they go to a, a party and he's dancing around. Yes, and his—I mean, his shoulders are so <laughs> hunched when he's dancing, and you see it from a bunch of different angles. But they do a lot of uh, from this balcony overhead. You yeah. see all these shots, and two times in the movie, two times, he chases down a young black, like perp. Yeah, two times. <laughs> A 5'4 <laughs> scoliosis potential candidate at that you know, point in his life where you're looking yeah. at him and be like, there might be some spinal issues here. <laughs> Even though you just bear out and be like, now nah, that's just a posture all these years later. Right. Twice. Well, that happens in French Connection, too, that Gene Hackman, who is considerably older than Pacino when he's playing Popeye Doyle, <laughs> chases down a black guy in the beginning of the movie. And he's like, come I on I just remember now. the first Wearing one. Wearing a Santa outfit. 
the first one that he takes down, it's the rape scene. Yeah. The guy is like kind of casually jogging. Right. And they cut to Pacino and he's like He's full sprint. Just like Looney Tunes style though. Because his arms are and his face is grimacing, his arms are just pumping a mile a minute. And the other guy is just kind of like, you know, doop doo 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 And he's like slowly like it's tortoise and hair or something. Yeah, basically. Oh, I love that when I saw that the first time. It's because the first one you're like, okay, maybe he's amped up on adrenaline. Yeah, yeah. And the second one when he's chasing the the I think the second one is the rape victim right. one. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're making this convenient. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a little, a little bit. This this guy chased out twice. <laughs> twice. It's like with Tim Roth and the Ed Norton Hulk. So oh, he, yeah. You can't oh. put a guy with a clear, you know, he's just he's so tiny oh, to, to take on the Hulk. I'm yeah, sorry. It, Look, Tim Roth is an intimidating actor. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I love but, the guy. But that being said. Take on the Hulk? <laughs> mm, Even as a bomb. Let's give that to The Rock or whoever was the equivalent at the time. Right, right. Well, this is Sidney Lumet, who had done a bunch of films, right? He, you know, I think he does Prince of the City later with Treat Williams later on in the 70s. Yeah, it's kind of the same film. Almost. Yeah, kind of, yeah. Um, it's a three-hour. Except that was like two hours and 45 minutes. Yeah. Such a, I remember that being two VHSs whenever I'd go into the blockbuster or whatever, and I'd see it in the crime drama section or whatever. It was always like two VHS. I'm like, oh, that's a long fucking movie. I don't know if I could invest two hours and whatever much in the movie and stuff. Uh, but not a lot of not a lot of name actors in the movie either. So it, it was it was a fun exploration that Pacino no. is the focus of and this whole thing. Even when they are, yeah, like in very uh, small parts. Yes, yeah. Um, F. Murray Abraham. Yeah, on the Narco Squad. Right, just out of nowhere, you're like, what the f-? F. Murray Abraham. Okay, and he's gone. That's <laughs> right. That's his entire role in the entire. In the movie. That is it. It's like four scenes. Yeah. Done. Like, wow. I wish they'd do another movie together, because they did that and Scarface. I wish they'd do one more movie together, F. Murray and uh, Pacino. Just one more before they go. I would love it. Why not? <laughs> I love me some of both. Maybe he's an Irishman. Maybe he's going to be an Irishman. That would be awesome, if you F. Know, Murray. Let's get Marty on the blower. Oh, yeah. And just be like, listen, have you thought about F. Murray? I That's know you got idea. Romano. Yeah. Now that you got the dream cast all rounded out. Yeah. Let's get F. Murray on this bad boy. <laughs> Don't let those big eyebrows cover your eyes. See F. Murray Abraham for Please. God's sake. <laughs> Please. You know he's great. He's you know he's great. He won an Oscar. Uh, so that was your number three, right? Yeah. All right. So then my number three. Are we at My number three, right? We're up to that one? Yep. All the President's Men. Punt. <laughs> wow. Punt. All right. What's your number two? My number two is the punt from you just a second ago. Yes. The, the inside. Okay. Number two. Ooh. Love it. Wow. Cemented Russell Crowe. Speaking of Pacino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, you know, Gladiator came out. And you're like, all right, well, is this all he can do? Yeah. I don't know. And then Insider came out. And I was like, fucking... A story I knew. Yeah. A story right. we, we both lived. Of course. I remember, you know, In tobacco, actual time, yeah. Four years saying that there is no definitive... Yeah. Link between tobacco products and cancer. Even though we all fucking knew it, what there was exactly. Yeah, it was one of the you know worst kept secrets in in modern you know society. Right. We all knew it. We just didn't know whether or not they knew it, and for how long they knew it, yep. and how long they've been keeping it from us. And just that that simple story and prem, uh, premise, and how uh, was it Jeffrey Wigand? Wigand? Yeah, something like that. That's Russell Crowe's character. Yes. And then, Pacino works for sixty minutes. Yes, he's he's isn't he Mike? He's the producer. He's a producer for Mike Mark, Mike Wallace's stuff for sixty minutes. I yeah, think right, something like that. Yeah, but he's he's one of the big producers at sixty minutes, and this yeah. is a true story. Yep, and it's how basically they got Jeffrey Wigand to eventually go on the record, and the worst part is is all the trials and tribulations, the how many times they had to assure him the threats on his family's life, like when he opens the mailbox mm-hmm. and there's just a single bullet in there. Ugh. And uh, uh, I don't know how much of this is true, but i got to assume it's, it's, it's pretty close. Probably pretty close, yeah. I have to assume it's pretty close. And the fact that all this happens and then the fallout from it is kind of insignificant initially. Yeah. Ultimately, it's what he wanted and what he did it for. But he comes out and it's just like a... Yeah, this is a thing, but it's not as big. You would assume that that is the levee breaking and instant flood comes. Right. Because at the end of it, like, it's Pacino moving on to the next story. Yeah. And the the public's attention is already captivated by the next thing. Yeah. Which was Kaczynski, I believe. Yeah. He's off in the, yeah, the, the forest up yep. in Montana or, yep. or the Dakotas or wherever it is. By the way, Manhunt Unabomber is supposed to be fantastic. It is. It's good. You're watching it? I watched it. <sighs> My wife and I watched it. How it's many episodes good. is it? Eight. Fuck. All right. That's my Saturday. 
Or a Sunday, is, rather. That's my my Sunday. was like, I don't remember this. I know the name, yeah. but I, I was like, oh, I remember this. Oh, yeah. I remember, of like... Of course. The, I mean, I remember the second time around, because mm-hmm. I, was, I was a child, or when did he start? I may not have been born the first, you know, couple times. Oh, maybe. I thought he'd been doing it only recently, last 20 years. I didn't know he'd been doing it for a long time. Yeah, he took like six years off in the middle wow. of it. Wow. And then okay. came back to it. Okay. Which I didn't, I didn't know about the previous. I knew about the six years, and then Unabomber was everywhere. Well, see, that's the thing. I want to read. I want to watch the show then to understand. There's one else, really I mean, cool reveal I had no idea about. And they're like, oh, shit, really? Wow. wow. You'll know what I'm talking about after okay. you watch it. Okay. I'm definitely watching it. Uh, anyway, but, so yeah. But yeah, within that, so like this, which is ultimately, it, it, changed our society yeah by this guy stepping forward he genuinely just like serpico cleaned up new york city yeah it maybe had an effect on uh graft and whatnot in other cities right this had a international impact yep this guy just coming forward and couldn't live with himself anymore and how many scientists before him yeah. had just taken the check had turned a blind eye right to it. right how many tobacco executives had turned a blind eye to this I just rationalize it going, well, everybody knows that it causes cancer. So what do I need to hurt our profits and our, our right. stock, stock portfolio and valuation for? That's what money does, man. Yeah. People see that. People see the zeros on the paycheck and they go, fuck it, I'm going to sell my soul for this shit. I, I want to have the money. I want to live in this life. I want to have this, this, or that. Yeah, create it, a future for my family. Yeah, yeah, I guess. But it's built on the fucking Sunday, a foundation of sandcastles because it's not real. It's a foundation of, of blood. Yeah. There you go. Even that. Even worse. Even worse, man. Yeah, I, I, but so that's why the the film itself and the film is a long. It's almost like what three hours? It's like two hours and a half, two and a half hours, a little over two and a half hours. Yeah, it's, it's a, a long, long one. I don't remember the full runtime because I never the length of it never bothered me. Two hours and thirty seven minutes. Wow, okay. man! And that's that's an intensely it long. Doesn't even film. seem like that. No, it does because it, it doesn't rather because you're going, you're just following, you're going on this journey, and there's constant tension. Yeah, the and ups and downs worry. of yeah. how this finally got to air because you All think right. it's it's like oh yeah, the easy breezy. This guy's going right. to totally, you know, for lack of a better term, turn state's evidence. You know? Right. But that's, it's a complex question. Right. Because you're imperiling your entire life, and not mm-hmm. just your life, the life of your family, and outside of your nuclear family, potentially, what about yeah. your parents or your yeah. brothers, sisters, their kids? Exactly. Uh, you know, how serious is Big Tobacco about guarding the secret? Right. And Russell does a great job of walking that line. You know, he put he put on thirty extra pounds, I think, to do this part, and you and he aged himself, and you didn't put on, didn't put like a shit ton of makeup to look older. You, he just kind of physically did it. They whitened his hair, and he had that kind of dumpier look, and it works for it worked for him. And you bought him, you believed it, and you're right. Coming out of Gladiator, he's just like incredibly strong, powerful man. Oh yeah. And to see him like make this kind of a change, it's almost De Niro esque in that way with Jake LaMotta and what he did in Raging Bull. Call. Yeah, it's like the same kind of thing, and so you see him kind of become uh, lesser than or, uh, you know, kind of a submissive person. And you buy him as an intellectual. You do. Yeah, you absolutely buy him as an intellectual. And so it's so that's what's so great about the movie. And, of course, Pacino does a great job as the producer. And then like, there's that moment where they don't know if they're going to run with the story or go with the story. And he's like, I've sacrificed my family, all this kind of stuff going on. And you're not going to run the story. You're not going to go yeah. with this. Like, it's all of that. So you're just like, fuck, even the person who has been pushing him to talk about it might turn on him in yeah. the last second. You're like, this is insane. Because now... The shit is about to hit the fan. Yeah. And Wallace and the executive producers and uh, CBS right. and the lawyers and everybody steps in and be like, is this worth the lawsuit? Right. Because, you know, the lawyers sit over going, well, I definitely think this is. Mm-hmm. Because of the billable hours on this. <laughs> this is going to make us, our bonus this year is going to be awesome. So I got to imagine they were advising <laughs> against, but while going, but, you know, guys, yeah. this is a good thing you're this- doing. What what is the the what is it the the fourth estate? Yeah. What is the fourth estate for <laughs> if not to uh, protect the public interest? <laughs> I got to assume somebody at that at law firm was saying something along those lines. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, why not? <laughs> we got to protect our you know Malibu or Hamptons <laughs> beach house. We got. Right. Uh, all right, so that was your. That was my two. All right, so my two was Serpico, which we already talked about. Gee, I wonder what your number one. Is. <laughs> I wonder what your number one is. Uh, mine is all the prezes, man. Yeah, what a good, f- I, what interesting uh, 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 juxtaposition or oh, connection here we have. If you're doing the film, Mark Felt is what inspires us to do this, and Mark Felt was, of course, involved in all the presidents' men as well. It was uh, Hal Holbrook in, who was uh, deep throat in, I think, in all the presidents' men. Okay, I I'd think that was him because uh, for some reason I am utterly blanking. I think it was him because, like. 
who is the Mar- I remember Martin Balsam is on the staff. Uh, Jason Robarts pay, plays Bill Bradley. Yeah. Yeah. And Hal Holbrook is deep throat. Yep. Okay. Oh, there we go. Look at all this coming around. He's the one who plays Mark Felt, essentially. So what a good, what a, an incredible film. It's when you said whistleblower, yeah. this was with, I mean, synapse fired, first thought, boom, yeah. all the president's men, what's number two? Right. Because this to me is the quintessential, I mean, since World War II, the power of the presidency has only grown exponentially. Mm-hmm. Because there's a number of things through executive orders and whatnot, the power of the presidency is starting to, it's getting to a degree that it was never intended to. Right. It's almost dictatorship, almost. On some level, just because. No matter who's in power. It is. Yeah. Because they have control of nuclear weapons Mm -hmm. and they're left unchecked. Yep. I don't care if you agree with the guy or not. The fact that someone, it's ultimately just one person's call Mm -hmm. and there's no one that can step in his way. Right. It's his his decision. So since then, the power of the presidency has grown to a degree that two reporters managed to take out the cliched line of the most powerful individual in the free world. Mm-hmm. Is absolutely unequivocally incredible. To yep. Me. Yeah, and this film does such a great job of exploring that mm-hmm. and the step by step process of it because what people sometimes forget is it took two years to get him out of office two years of constant uh, articles and researching and you see the journey that they go on and they're great companions to each other with Woodward and Bernstein because one is like emotional and Dustin Hoffman's like so emotional and, and uh, Robert Redford's more of the methodical pace and then there's times where it's teaching uh, uh, Hoffman to be a little more patient, and there's time, and then Hoffman's teaching Redford to be a little more reactive, a little more uh, d- driven to uh, to get the answers. Yeah. So you see how they influence each other to get to uh, mm-hmm. the ultimate goal, which is to find out what actually happened with Watergate and this whole situation, which of course is complete and utter madness that they would do this to break into your opponents. Uh, uh, you know the Democratic headquarters to get information yeah, but that you didn't even fucking need. You didn't even need. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Ultimately, there were no stakes. Like it, it, it wouldn't have helped you no matter what was there because yeah. victory was so firmly in hand. It's paranoia combined with hubris. Yeah, which which uh, was so uh, insane. Well, and you, you think you had the edict of the silent majority, which he's you know he coined that. Yeah, day. he did. Uh, which there is truth in that. Mm-hmm. You know, I think until Reagan. He might have had one of the, the he might have had the largest victory oh, in presidential yeah, history. Yeah, until Reagan beat Mondale, right? Yeah, I think Reagan is now number one because he right. took what every state but one. Yeah, but one. Um, but yeah, to, to have power so firmly in your grasp, mm-hmm. and yet now, like, to have this 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 almost pissant operation over the side drive you to a degree that you you illegally have someone else break into it. Is absolutely like it's it's mind blowing that yep. the president could become so fixated upon something that is insignificant given the scope of their job. Right. But I guess when all you hear is the critique, and, yeah. You know, think of the critique we get on this, and sometimes that it 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 can bother you because you don't feel like the person. The critique only bothers me when I don't feel like the person understands. Yes, agreed. If they've read into it and they'll be like, all right, well, your position is different from mine, but I respect it. Like, right. It's this is opinion based. So yeah. if you don't have the same opinion, like. Okay. Yeah. Like, I can't fight you on it, but it's when, like, you're not even understanding. Right. Like, uh, sometimes when people break our balls and be like, how did you not have this? And be like, well, because in sentence two of when we set the topic, yeah. we said we're excluding that movie. Just like, you're, you're not listening. Right. So please just listen. Like, yeah, if you exactly. want to critique after that and say, <laughs> I did listen and this is where you're wrong, be like, okay. Great. Well, uh, yeah. then you're entitled to your opinion, but right. until it's a fact based opinion it's just like i can't listen to it i try to respond to everybody who miss like completely misunderstands the the subject or the topic or what yeah. we're doing you know and so i always try to kind of clarify with them but you're right it's frustrating when you it is the situation. But like, right. so when all you hear is critique is the yeah. president yeah sometimes i guess maybe it's the pettiest ones that you hold on to because you're like i could fucking crush you well and this is what drives me nuts sometimes in the showdown like some of the some of the contestants will go on youtube and read these horrible comments about themselves and 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 like, like disappear, like mentally, like disattach or go away or like take it to heart, let it overwhelm them. You know, my mistake is getting involved in these petty squabbles on the movie trivia slowdown page, which I've I'm done now, ever doing again uh, on Facebook. 
But other contestants go into the YouTube, and when they lose, when they lose, they go and read the YouTube comments, which I always think is a phenomenal mistake. Because for every person that supports you, there are other people who want to make fun of you and denigrate you, who are jealous of the attention you get and the yeah. the, the the platform that you have because they don't have it, and they and they're going to criticize you and your knowledge or without having any remote clue of what this experience is like. And so, but some of our our friends or people we know hold on to those petty little critiques and like let them let them mess them up and it's just it's phenomenal to me you know but yeah but i understand why sometimes it's 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 hard not to yeah i know i agree yes even when they're being how they feel innocuous yeah they don't feel like they're they're being threatening sometimes that's even worse yeah yeah like uh i think i've been tagged numerous times in um I should be replaced in our team yeah, because just... I'm holding you back. <laughs> and it's like a okay, That's like a... all right. I don't know how I don't know how as an adult I'm supposed to process that information. Yeah, like I don't get offended, but at the same time, it's like I feel like I'm then not respecting myself, and maybe I should be offended. And then I'm like, why the fuck am I even thinking about this? Exactly. And then I don't log on anymore. It's a fucking movie trivia contest. God yeah. damn it! Look, but, but at the same time, I people... appreciate they have passion. Sure, but. But that kind of stupidity drives me insane because they're just repeating shit for fucking attention with no fucking knowledge and no real understanding of how our team works or really under- watching our matches or not knowing what our discussions are when we're on those, uh, when we're spinning the wheels, getting the two points that we're discussing that you're coming up with the answer because all you hear is the answer. You don't know how, if Matt knew it before I did. Yeah. Or what, like I say this all the time that you pull our asses out of the fire more times than well, I can it's, say. It's- we you do. Know, we compliment each other. It well. comes down to yeah, exactly. Uh, we both have blind spots. Yes, and we animation both are, is mine, and that is a big strong spot for you. Well, that, yeah, that one's like there. There are a bunch that are good, and it's like the a bunch of classics. Yeah, it's fucking, I'm not even like. Trust me, <laughs> I I trust your guess. Yes, you know, in that category, better than I trust mine. And <laughs> there are certain ones like uh, uh, when we got uh, Field of Dreams. And it right. was at Burt Lancaster. Right. But I already knew you knew that. And you're like, and I just literally was like, go. Oh, yeah. Was, trust me. That's one. Because when we've talked <laughs> Field of Dreams, I think the first time we ever talked about it, you yeah. pulled his name before I did. Yeah. I was like, okay, I know you know that information faster than I do. Yeah. Just like, I know it's, go ahead, but it's Burt. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, but yeah, so the president, I can only imagine because all he hears, and now like for Trump, yeah, it's got to be a, I mean, just oppressive because it's nonstop from his phone, his email, if he still has email, right. uh, on television. Like, can you imagine that? Turning on TV and nonstop people are talking shit about you. Yeah. Like, I don't care if you dislike the guy or like the guy, whatever the case is. Just put yourself in the, his shoes in that, like, you could literally flip past 10 to 15 channels, and that's a conservative estimate. Mm-hmm. And at any given time, like, especially if it's late night, they're all talking shit about you. Yeah. They're all. Right. How does that not bother you? Well, sure. But, and then there's this pig headed determination to stay who you are, no yep. matter what, because you surround yourself, like you said, presidents around some of these sycophants, these sycophants who are going to say, or going to say, everyone else is wrong. You're right. Mm-hmm. You're the. How do you deny the president? Right. When you're that some close. Some people can't. Some people can't. It'd be tough because you're also there, like we said before, because you side with them. Right. You understand. His message. But he even turns on the people who he side, like yeah. the session stuff. Yeah. He's turning on sessions. Now, sessions like was one of the first people to come forward and publicly endorse the guy. And now he turns on him because he did the right thing, which was to recuse himself from the Russia situation because he had connections to the situation. Well, and now Trump is mad at him for recusing him. So I said, I wouldn't have named him attorney general. Trump thought he was in the loyalty business and he's in the politics business. Exactly. And that's a different animal entirely. Oh, yes. Yeah, he, he demands ultimate loyalty. Well, unfortunately, in politics, <laughs> that is not the case. Nope. And he'll find out as soon as – if this stuff really starts to come out in a more powerful way, speaking of whistleblowing, if they find a deep throat within this uh, White House – and this White House has been leaking like a, like a, a boat sieve. with a shit ton of holes. Yeah, a sieve. There's so many leaks that come out of the White House. I mean, it, you don't go within five hours of something happening, and there's a full story from the New York Times from sources of people inside the White House. It's insane how many people just want to tell what's going on in that White House because they know this is a madman. This is essentially a madman. I don't mean like a North Korea madman. I mean, this guy is an egotistical maniac, and not in a good way. In, no. It, it, you know, well, there's th- no such thing as a good egotistical well, maniac. There's not. 
Okay, fine. Doesn't matter who they are. Okay. Because <laughs> they're so self serving. So I guess you're right. That uh, there is no empathy for their fellow man. <laughs> that's fair. It's that's me, fair. me, me, and fuck you. Right, right. Well, that's what it seems like with this whole thing. And that's what's so incredible that he, he the fact that he keeps withstanding this barrage, but he becomes even more petty and more petty and more suspicious and more. Like, it's working for him. Yeah, I guess so for now. I think we'll see it midterms. Yeah. That's where if the rubber makes meets the far. road. Yeah, right. Uh, he'll make it there. It's it's really difficult to take out a sitting president unless you uncover a huge smoking gun. Well, that's what I'm saying, and I wonder if there is a whistleblower here. I wonder if there is a, a Mark yeah, Felt or Deep Throat. Only time will tell. Will yeah. that investigation yield anything, or will yeah. it not like most political investigations? Right. But this investigation in the film obviously yields the end of Nixon and, and whatever. And it's such great work by Redford and, and Hoffman here. They're still young as actors, yeah. still uh, coming up in, in the business. And Alan J. Pe- Pecula, who directed, does a great job with directing the movie. Oh, phenomenal. The, the, the God's Eye View in yes. the, the Library of Congress. Oh, yeah. And man. You start in the close of them and you pull back and you just you feel the enormity yes! of the task at hand. Yes. Yeah. That's such a great point, man. Yeah, you, you start and it seems like, yes, of course, it's all right here in front of you. And you pull back and you just. This is representative of you're going up against. Yeah. This is a tidal wave coming at you. And you're like a matchstick. Right. And can you make it through that to the other side? It's just it, it, such a beautiful choice and shot. Yeah. And, you know, Redford and Hoffman at the top of their games. Yeah. Just with so much bravado and confidence. Yeah. Uh, and, and great older character actors. Uh, supporting them along the way, yeah. like Jason Robards with an incredible voice of his. Like the, one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when they come to him, like near the end, at his house late at night, and he has that conversation with them on the uh, on, in the law on the front lawn. He says, "You guys better be right. Nothing else is riding on this except the you know the future of the United States." And he's just like, "Whoa, shit!" It yeah. just lets you know the stakes so simply, you know. And it's so and, great. And Martin Balsam does a great job as well. And Martin, we've seen a number of classic films. Him as like supporting them and then wanting to take the way as it gets deeper, wanting to take the story away from them and bring in more seasoned reporters. And then uh, Jack Warden like defends them and yep. wants to. So there's so much about the film that feels gritty and good and interesting. And then you feel pain for. Uh, um, Stephen Collins, mm-hmm. and you feel pain for his wife, who has to kind of talk about this stuff and doesn't want, and gets wrapped up in this. And the like, Hoffman seduces the sister to let to get into this woman and get the information. It's it's dirty pool at times, but also it's interesting work uh, with these characters. Like when Hoffman goes to interview that weird lawyer down in the South oh, who yeah. sits out on his balcony yeah, and yeah, shit. Yeah. You're just like, this is so insane how casually he's speaking about treason. It's fascinating, dude. So such a great film. I know. It's, it's weird when you see like power at that level. You think as a kid growing up that it's, it's somehow – Elevated bun, uh, above the mundanity of day to day life, right? And th- then the older you get, you realize that the the axiom of all politics is local is true. In that, pressing the flesh and in getting out and one on one is ultimately how anything gets done. Yeah, doesn't matter how huge of a question or a problem it is. Yeah, it is. It you know more often than not it just comes down to. A few people in a room making the decision. Yep. It's like, that's, that's bananas. <laughs> and I can just casually go, yeah, yeah, this is what we're going to do. Like, I, I can't imagine being in the room of like World War II when they're planning out Normandy and knowing yeah. well, we're going to lose at least this percentage mm-hmm. and having to, okay, well, who can we lose? How are we going to lose it? Like, you, have to, you can only make this choice once. Yeah. Like, or, oh, my God. Or even Truman deciding about the bomb. Yeah, the bomb. That's Shit, the firebomb we did before that was oh, more yeah. catastrophic than the bo- atom bombs themselves. That's true. It's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. That's brutal. Watch the fog of war out there if nobody's oh, ever seen that. Man. McNamara is just talking about that. That could be my favorite documentary. It's, it's a tough documentary. It's chilling. Yeah. Oh, dude, I think I've seen that thing like 20 times. Really? I Fuck, man. I got an early digital download of it mm-hmm. like years ago, and it is, I have moved it from hard drive to hard drive as I've upgraded it. And wow. I watch it every couple of years now. Jesus. I just find it fascinating. It, it's what you should. It's 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 an intense documentary. If you haven't watched it, you 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 will do yourself a favor and watch it. You'll understand the Vietnam War even more, and and our history of war and yeah. what we've done through the years, through the decades. Yeah, why you make wars. the choices and yeah, you know, I had heard of the fire bombings, but that was that opened my eyes. Yeah. Like, oh my god, they start showing the statistics, and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, I mean, the only reason we weren't tried as war criminals is because we won. 
Yeah. It's the only reason. Mm -hmm. And because we we refuse to. Uh, All right. So then my number one whistleblowing film, which we punned from your number six for some God knows what reason, uh, On the Waterfront. Okay. Fantastic film. Eli Kazan, Marlon Brando, Carl Malden, Eva Marie Saint. I own it in Criterion. But Matt, I agree. tell me why. (laughs) With the exception of Michael Clayton. Yes. Everything else above it is based on a true story. Okay. And that's why I like it. Those above. Oh. Above. I mean. Uh, above. Uh, are on the waterfront. Right. Um, if I say above the waterfront, I'm like, right. that's good. What? I've got it written down. Um, because they all had real world consequences. To mm-hmm. me, the, the stakes of the film mean more because I can actually see the change that they did. Right. And Clayton, I think I just enjoy more than. That's fair. It's just. It's a subjective nature. As, of as an overall. Look, yeah. performances. And that is Brando at his absolute best. Apex. Yeah. His acting stands up. Uh, I just watched it again a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, thoroughly stands up. There are other moments in it where I don't think the movie, like the acting style and the choices and whatnot, stand oh, okay. up as well for me. Okay. Um, but because the others on my list above it were mm-hmm. just true, just like, well, I give those more weight for a whistleblower. Yeah. Um, given okay. the, the gravity of it. But it, please, it's an excellent film. Yeah, that's why, because I love it to pieces, and it's so, it's something that I watch all the time. It's uh, like, like you watch Clayton, like, like I've watched On the Waterfront so many times. I've watched everything there is about Like mm-hmm. when I got the Criterion Collection, I devoured the fucking discs because I just want to know so much about it because it's an allegory to uh, the uh, commune of the Red Scare that happened in the 50s. That's what the film is portraying. That's what Ilya Kazan is a guy who gave names. And so okay. he is, and that's why a lot of people who are uh, part of the Red Scare later on when they found out this really hated the film because it is Ilya Kazan is in essence portraying himself as Marlon Brando, giving information about people he thought were communists in Hollywood. Okay. And so it's a way of kind of, a poly, like a way of like absolving himself of his crime. And if you, if you recall in the Oscars, when they gave him the Lifetime Achievement Award, some actors sat on their hands on purpose to, to uh, oh. protest him receiving it because they felt that he betrayed Hollywood and betrayed people who were... I didn't know yeah. that. I'll yeah. go look that up. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an intensely difficult situation because Kazan is one of my favorite directors, yet this is kind of a thing that happened during yeah, his time. It's a black so. mark on your past. Absolutely. And who knows his reasons for why he did it or whatever, but the film itself irregardless of that allegory, is still a fun, fantastically f- well-done film. And for me, it's, I just love Brando to pieces in this film, more than Streetcar Named Desire. He, there's a, I will yeah, happily agree to that. Yeah, there's a nobility to him in his simplicity, in his dumbness, in his inability to understand mm-hmm. the world because his brother is smarter than him. But in a way, his brother being smarter than him leads to his brother's downfall as well. Oh, it does. Right? And then Lee J. Cobb. And- and where Brando finds himself. Yes. Like, you know, he pivots and, right. and decides I'm going to have a different trajectory for my life. But yeah. he had been going with what his brother felt. The famous scene in mm. the end when he's in the back seat In the car, yeah. Yeah, in the car. You know, which we've all heard the line a million times. Yeah. The first time you see it, you feel, mm-hmm. you feel him. He, he could have been a contender saying, right. like, I didn't have to be down in the gutter this is your fault. Yeah. You told me to take a dive. You dragged me down here with you. You're my brother. You're smarter than me. You should have known better. You should have been looking out for me. You should have been looking out for me, which is what he says. Yes. To you should have been looking out how, for me. How do you not? Yeah. How do you fucking not? Right. Like, no one in this world is supposed to have my back except my family. Yeah. And the fact that my family is willing to sell me out for short-term gains. Right. To, a, to somebody else who's not family. Yeah. Right. If you sell each other to family, that's something else. But to someone who's Maybe. not family, that's just a, a powerful thing. But then, and then you have this like he's a leg breaker. He's essentially a leg breaker now because he took the dive. Yeah, he's and, an enforcer. An enforcer, right? No one will give him a fight anymore, and so he's lost that uh, that ability to possibly be a champion, a world champion. Who knows how it could change his life? So you now he's living in the neighborhood, and he's a leg breaker. He's a he's an enforcer, like you said. And then, but then you have this uh, this other thing with Eva Marie Saint, this like tender romance that occurs. Mm-hmm. She's like this, like a, like she's like this, like little bird, and he's like this, like bro- like slamming bear, slamming into shit kind of bear, and she domesticates him. She through her kindness, through her softness, through her sweetness. Sure, he starts to change because he now sees something else, something better that he could sacrifice for, that he could be a vehicle to ch- for change in a way that he. 
he maybe he wanted to be as a as a mm-hmm. as a boxer. Who knows? But now you see this, and then Carl Malden as the priest is so great. So he, th- this is a bigger story now that he is possibly changing the world with or in because of how he is as a person. And that's what I love about the film. Even the dumbest, well, you want to say dumb, but even the most simple person can change the world or can change his environment or his situation by a stubborn desire to do what's right. And you see that. And even when he's beat up, even when the people who he is fighting for turn on him yeah. and don't want his help, he still pushes through to show them. You know, and what I love the uh yeah. the, the 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 camera of him like stumbling forward, the camera shot from his point of view after he's been beaten up by Lee J. Cobb and left for dead by all these guys. And even Marie Saint helps him stand up and he wants to walk on his own to work. He wants to show the guys that he's willing to take the hits by these because they, they question whether he's actually on their side because he was part of the people that were keeping them down for such a long time. So yeah. it's such a great film in that way and what it explores and how you have to create understanding for situ- for people like this who want a second chance to make a difference, you know? Yeah, there's always, you know, the old saying is there are no second acts in life. But mm. That's not true. Right. As long as you can take a redemptive uh, turn, anything is possible. Yeah. yeah. And the second act in life actually could be a downturn as opposed to an upturn, right. making the positive choice, like... So the fact that he did and, and what you brought up before is like his indignancy towards them because he's trying to lift them up mm-hmm. as well as himself. Yeah. And they're, they don't want to hear it. Yeah. They don't. And, you know, it takes him like he un- it almost seems as though he understands it at the same time he doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's it's it almost it practically escapes him. And yet he's still like he's got a hold of the comet's tail, mm-hmm. but he doesn't have a hold like it's still slowly kind of getting away, but not really. Right. And he suffers so much to achieve it. Yeah. You know, because I mean, what what those kids, those kids even turn on him and, and do what they do to his pigeons. It's it's fucking heartbreaking. That whole film is just full of heartbreak for him as he's trying to change his world and change his situation. And like all great whistleblowers. He had no intention of being a whistleblower, and he's in this situation. All of a sudden, he feels that what he has to do is right against what everyone else that he loved and cared about is telling him. Yeah, you know, so fan- so that's why I love it as as well. So, all right. Anyway, let's let's uh, haggle out this list, uh, Mister Nost. So obviously, you added at six. So we'll have to put all the presidents men at one. I think. Okay. Uh, do you want to write down, and I'll do the banging and number this, that, and the other. Because I don't have a pen in front okay, of me, so I okay, can't okay. write down. Sure, sounds good. So all the president's men is number one. Sure. Okay. I, I can accept that. Uh, I, I believe <laughs> I know what the next sentence is going to be. <laughs> no, no. No, no. As much as I would like on one, on one, the fact you put it at six means we have to kind of move it down a little bit. So I have Serpico at two. You have it at three? Correct. But you have Insider at two. I have Insider at two. Where do you have that? Uh, four. All right, Serpico. All right. That's easy. Okay, and then? Um, Do well, we, Insider, I have a two, but... I have it at four, so we, I guess we'll put it there, and then we can... Can we put on the waterfront at four? Yeah, that works. All right, all right. That works. Well, that kind of works out rather seamlessly. Then we both had Brockovich at five. Yes. So let's do that there. Okay. And then you had Clates at uh, eight? Uh, ten. You have Michael Clayton at ten? Yeah. Fuck, that's my number four. Okay. Sorry, buddy. Um, Sorry, Chief. Well, I had Constant Gardner next for me at seven. Yeah, that's my number six. Okay. So I'm cool with that. Pipe it in there. Okay. So it's at six? It's at six? Constant right. Gardner? Okay. Yes. Will you okay. give me Clayton at seven? <laughs> yes. It's my number th- yes. or four, yes. rather. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, prob- I like when you ask for these. like... Would it be okay with you if we did this? Listen. <laughs> I respect it. No, I Two appreciate it. Two-way street, baby. I appreciate it. Two-way street. Uh, all right, Michael Clayton at seven. All right. So we got three left. Yes. I think the only two we have in common left are China Syndrome and Silkwood. Silkwood, yeah. Do you want to do this through that eight and nine? Uh, we both have Syndrome at eight. I got Silkwood at nine. Where do you have Silkwood? I have it at seven. Oh, so it's kind of six one way, half a dozen the other. Right. I don't care. All right, let's do Silkwood at eight then. Fine. And then China Syndrome at nine? Yeah. Okay. And then I, I would say uh, Snowden then at 10. Uh, the Citizen Four one? Yeah. Okay. What did what you What else have? you got left? Because I got The Firm. Okay. And Citizen Four. 
heavier. heavier yeah, I just didn't yeah. include any documentaries. Yeah, but sometimes I, sometimes you do, which is why I allowed myself to do it this. Yeah, time. well, I did it once, but I know once in the past when we did a sports, you you did uh, We Were Kings. Oh, I did. Oh, when we I? were kings, that's right. Good point. And uh, all right, and I was like, you know, for certain subjects, I think exceptions need to be made. I agree with you because it helps me out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> All right, so uh, you do the banging, is that right? I will do the banging. Okay. Hoorah. Uh, we'll see if it picks up on these mics. Who knows? Who, who, who can say? You ready? Yes. Give me that falsetto. We didn't do... Uh, oh, we didn't do the... Uh, it, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there we go. There we go. Well, we got thrown off. All right. The top 10 whistleblower movies. Oof, man, that's a late night. That was, yeah. That was Sorry about it, guys. Gruff. All right. <laughs> At number 10. Citizen Four. At number nine is... The China Syndrome. At number eight... Silkwood. At number seven... Michael Clayton. Coming in at number six... The Constant Gardener. Now, starting out our top five at five... Aaron Brockovich. At number four... On the Waterfront. Coming in at the three spot is... The Insider. Our penultimate movie at number two, Serpico. And finally, our numero uno whistleblower movie is... All the President's Men. There it is. That's a good list. It is a good list. A lot of great movies. If you haven't watched any of these movies, get your ass on these movies and watch it. It's a good list and an even better show. Yeah. I th- oh, thank you. That's a really sweet And let's you. see if this one turns out. Yeah. Let's see if this one actually recorded or stopped. Because if we stop, I'm going to shoot somebody. So. Yeah. I, I think we might just put up a test pattern <laughs> for this episode and be like, it's jinxed. It's, it's jinxed. jinxed. I apologize. Yeah, we'll obviously. make it up somewhere for you. Obviously, the government's against us. They want to yes. stop us from talking about whistleblower movies and encouraging people to whistleblow. Uh, so to speak. So anyway, thanks to God. Thanks everybody for listening to this episode of the, of the Top Ten Show. Matt and I certainly appreciate it. Thanks for all the comments you've been leaving, all the tweets, all the messages, all the downloads. We're doing really well numbers wise, but we could be doing better. Always could do better. So I hope you're telling your friends and family about our show. Tell your college professors. Tell your people who teach film about our show to listen to our show and see if they enjoy it. And uh, uh, maybe that we'll find new listeners that way. You know? Yeah. Grassroots always Please, helps. Yeah, yeah. Tell one friend. If you know that they like movies yeah. and they like to listen to two blowhards talk. <laughs> that is not the way to pitch it. We're not. Trust me, it we is. We know what we're talking about. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, there's a lot of hot air in this room right That's now. True. A lot of hot air. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so if you know somebody that might be into the uh, to the show, uh, please tell them. Yeah. Um, to everybody that's reached out on Twitter and Facebook and on YouTube, we appreciate it so much. Right. Uh, we are under the Schmoes No RSS feed on iTunes or wherever you get your Android uh, shows. Yes. So if you want to find us to download us, uh, which, you know, I would say about 90% of you do, um, nothing against everybody on YouTube. Trust me. We love those, too. Absolutely. I Thank just, you so much. Those are just the numbers of, trust me, the, the vast majority. Yes. Download or stream us off of iTunes or whatever their Android device of choice is, like Podcast Addict, and, and mm-hmm. there's so many of them to choose from. Uh, but you can hear all of them there. And I just want to say a special thanks to Chris Alexakos for helping us out with everything with the Facebook page. The guy's Absolutely. been so on top of it, coming with numerous things to post every week. He's just money in the bank. So glad... Uh, he offered to help us. Yeah. Um, and we finally stopped, you know, <laughs> stopped being lazy and said, oh, it's nice that he wants to help. Numerous people reached out. And for whatever reason, like maybe he was just the, the most persistent. I'm not sure. Yeah. But the guy is awesome at it. So thank you so much. And uh, that is it for me. Follow me on uh, Twitter or Instagram at Matt Nost, M-A-T-T-K-N-O-S-T. And you guys can always follow me, follow me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, please also download the Cinephile, Cine Dash Files on iTunes, mm-hmm. the show I do with Steve, and of course uh, the Outlaw Nation over there on SK Plus Podcast Channel as well. Uh, thank you all so much for listening to us uh, this week, and uh, we will talk to you all next week. Ooh.